Hello everybody! If it's Wednesday, it's Warhammer, and that must mean it's time for another episode of Warhammer Weekly. Joining us, as always, is my co-host Tom. What's up, buddy? Hello, friends. How are you? Uh, yeah, I, I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, sadly, we are not joined by the one and only Owen Jackson tonight, but don't worry, we will have him back. Uh, by the way, everybody should keep bothering him in every place, way, and area where you can find him. Uh, it's amazingly funny, and I heard he loves it, so that's great. Loves it. Uh, we're uh, looking forward to the t-shirt. I hope everybody is ready for some hot PowerPoint action tonight. Oh, it's going to be so hot. The hottest of PowerPoints. Uh, so get ready for that as we talk about NPE and negative play experience. A lot of fun stuff we found in the survey. I am really, really excited about this one, honestly. Uh, I think I sent it to you earlier, Tom, so you could, you know, give yep. up or have it open yep. on a side screen or whatever, um, since, be, since there's a delay for you looking at it. But, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to get into it. Okay. Yep. At any rate, though, first, of course, news. So, rumor engines and stuff. It's up. What is this nonsense, Tom? What is this, what is this no. collection of jangles that we've got here? You know, it's a great question, right? Uh, I think that it's... I think it's dwarfy. Okay. Um, I don't. But I think it's a photoshopped picture because I think they took a picture of it and photoshopped out something underneath all this bejangles uh, as they have been wont to do from time to time. So this is what I'm going to say is that I look at uh, the little crescent moon bejangle. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Are you, are you speaking about like these little hooky hooks on the side? Or are you talking about down here this this hangy jangle? Like so, I don't, I can't see what you're. Yeah, putting I understand. Um, the so in the bottom shield, yes, panel. Uh huh. There are three little bojangles that hang out. There are indeed. The top right one, which looks like a little crescent moon, sure, is sort like of. super dwarfy. Okay. Like outlandishly dwarfy. Okay. Um. The uh, the the one kind of looks like a cog, although you know I don't know what to make of that. And the other one kind of looks like a hammer. Mm -hmm. um, is I mean, this what I Tom saying, what the dwarven players have called for? Is this the new united dwarf faction? Are they together I, again? Have the children think, of Grungi and Grimnir or Gobbledygook or whatever their silly gods' names are? Are they all back together? Uh, I could be see this being like a steam golem. Okay. okay. Like you know how the goal the golem faction we had talked about, or yeah, yeah. like not the golem faction, but like the um, like dwarves coming out swinging with like the full on mechy or not like not mechanical per se, but like the enchanted like yeah yeah I gotcha. yeah yeah yeah. So your prediction is yeah. Fire Slayers Part Two. You heard it here first. Thomas planted his flag. He's saying they're officially going to expand the worst-selling, least popular, least played army. No, I think that they're going to do the exact opposite. They're going to roll them into another faction, and that's how they fix them. Ah, that could be. I mean, it does make sense. Like, right, it's, like, it's a good like, solution. How do, how do you fix wood elves? You make them part of cities and make them not wood elves. Yeah, like, it's, it's a fair point. It's a fair point. Uh, well, if nobody's playing this on its own, what if we just lump it into something else? Right, and so I like, and then they can then they can further spruce Ko, right? Sure. sure. Um, and and supplement it with this other line of models. I don't know. I just it like there are a number of like I've painted a lot of dwarvy stuff. Sure. sure. And the bojangles, like the ornation here, is very similar to a lot of that. Now, don't believe that's a word, but that's fine. That's fine. It's distinctly different. Mm -hmm. so it's not the same i'm not saying it's the same yeah i get it you're saying it pays homage it's reminiscent yes. of it's in the same family mm. okay okay all right so that's what i would say uh the yeah somebody else in in a, in a group i'm in mentioned as well that there are some similar similarities between these little three things and the the three things that the zarina is wearing i think that's just pure coincidence it's three round things that have rough shapes sure, in them. Sure. Like, that's a pretty common iconography in Warhammer in general. Nurgle has the same three yeah. round things, often with stuff in them. Like, I don't think this is Nurgly, right? So, at any rate, uh, you know, here's what I'll say. 
the, the best solution for... You're not wrong. The best solution for Fire Slayer is both fixing the army, making it more interesting, and stuff like that would be to reunite it in some way into, into like, a combined clans book. And, mm -hmm. look, Auric War clans, their clans, they all got together. Uh, so these dwarv dwarves are, have, you know, clan families or whatever, so why not? Same thing, right? That's... Yep. It's the same it's the same concept. Um I don't know. Uh what I do know is that I don't care about dwarves. So <laughs> there we are. If they were to combine them together, I think that would be a positive thing, probably. That's my thoughts. What else we got, Tom? Um, I also, uh, we had some new Broken Realms fiction, and it's about somebody who you are quite partial to, Vince. I am. It's about Sigvald. Yeah, actually, both Sigvald and, uh, the new big fat guy are in there. And, uh, they have a bit of a, a dust up and whatever, and then, uh, some kind of avatar of Slanesh basically shows up and tells them, hey, 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 idiots, stop this. Uh, you need to get over to Excelsius real quick. They And they say it, like, in some kind of weird way that's like, you need to get to the place of the gathering storm where the door in the sky with the spear, whatever. It's Gur and it's Excelsius. And all of those things have, uh, like, th that's what it is. So It, he's, it makes it, me wonder. Go ahead. So it just, like, feels like they're, they're all roads are leading to Excelsius and the gate to Azir. Which Excelsius isn't on the gate, like it isn't part of the gate to his, his ear, like it's separate. Excelsius okay. is just uh, it's like uh, Excelsius is where the city of secrets or whatever was, right? Like that's where that yeah. narrative was, uh huh. Yeah. yeah, like that's just a prophetic coast thing. That's but that's in Akshi, like that's not in like I don't understand what the big deal is. I don't know. It's in Gur. Uh, That's where the story's pointing on to. Or Gur. Place. I'm sorry. It, yes, yeah. it's in Gur. Yeah. It's the same place it's where in the Gur, are currently actually. marching. Yeah. Sure. But my point being that it's not, it's not the entrance to Azir. Look, everybody's going there. For whatever reason, everybody's going there. How about that? Excelsius? That's yes. fine. I'll accept that. That we know for um, sure. And they keep yeah. talking about the sky swallowing the storm or, I don't know, some nonsense. So, at any rate, uh... The point is, is that it's going to be a party in Excelsius. And, uh, you know, it's, sure, whatever. We'll see what happens. Like, yeah, exactly. As as Skaith said, get to Excelsius. There's plot happening over there. I mean, that's basically what the Slanesh manifestation showed up and said. Like, hey, hey, idiots, you're in the wrong place. The plot's over there. Like, they wandered off camera. And, and Slanesh showed up and was like, hey, hey, hey. No, no, over there. That's where the hey, story party. is. Yeah, yeah, party. So, um. It, it let me tell you what Tom. It leads me the the fact that that was a, a piece of fiction leads me exactly yeah. to renew my fear that I mentioned when we did the Broken Realms prediction around this right. Yeah. My fear yeah. being destruction shows up, wallops order has a big victory, and then chaos just shows up and is like, her her her. Thanks for weakening both of you. Now we kill you both and get into whatever you know let you know fully get into az or whatever and just like and chaos is the actual winner of all that how boring if that ends up being how it plays out and don't get me wrong i say that as an uh, unabashed devotee of slanesh right uh right. i still don't want to see that be the end of that story because that's so that's so rote. tired that's so rote like oh you've all played into my my clever chaos plans awesome. oh wow Again, huh? Zinch is at work again. Yeah, got it again. No, one more time. Oh, you tricky bird! <laughs> that sneaky chicken. He is. He is on. Uh, so what? Was yeah, it? yeah. I'm like I'm mixed. I, I hope we. You know, we've talked about where we think the end of Broken Realms is going. Um, I. You had mentioned Skaven. Yep. Which I'm seeing is okay. less and less likely as they're not showing up in any stories. Well, they're ninja rats. I guess. Uh, one of my fears or proposals was that the new getting started box was actually orcs. Do you remember that? Iron I Jaws? do, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was one of my potential calls. Well, there's uh, been just... so much talk of destruction. I mean, that your call feels a lot better than mine. Let me say that. 
Yeah, uh, we'll see. I mean, I hope that it's Skaven, because they could use a whole revamped line. Yes. That said, mm-hmm. I could imagine, like, a great green wog, like, something, sure. right? Sure, sure. Yeah, like a re a re exploration of that concept, and then they can push Sons of Behemoth. They can, they can push a bunch of other things in the midst of all of that. Yeah. Um, I, look, if the end of this road with destruction is they have some kind of actual like narrative presence. pathos and presence in the story, great. Then I'm going to call it a win <laughs> because right yeah. now they don't. You know what I want them to do is just go all converge on the all points and just have a punch up and just take it, all of it over. They're like, no, no, OCR, Catacross, out. This is ours. Sure. No, Archeon, out. This is ours. Fine and it basically just be turned into a big fight arena. I think that'd be great. A, a big Orky fight arena. Yeah, arena. sounds fantastic. Anything that means death gets destroyed, I fully support. So, yeah. But that. my point being that, like, how amazing would it be if if he's just like, oh, we're going to easier, hard right, take an Archeon Citadel. Done. Be great. It's mine. Um, I don't think that'll happen. I'd love if it did. Um, we need more or- orcs in all of our lives. Um, but related to the Slanesh story, uh, let's. I'm going to jump to the lore article on Slanesh that got dropped, and they yeah, said sure. like Slanesh is free. Well, no, a shard of like Slanesh that was a statement in the article. Slanesh is the key in Marathi's thing. She mm-hmm. like Slanesh birth is births birthses births. Big Bertha's, uh, a a part of itself out into the world. Yes. That's the Promethean form, but it's always been Slanesh. Like Slanesh is still in chains, and Slanesh is out there in in the world. Okay, in this Promethean. Let form. me just say, if you go rewatch that video, that's what I proposed. Is that what Escape was just more Slanesh? Right. It's all just Slanesh. I mean, that's what they seem to say in the article quite a ways back when they first talked about this. This is two months ago now or something. It's just more... Like, Slanesh has release, or escape. There's more Slanesh. There's always more Slanesh. Yeah, I mean, it's a chaos god, right? Like, its form is not such constituted that it cannot be in multiple... It it can't be in multiple places at at once, right? They are both one and fully the same. And they are both Slanesh. Uh, If we get one more, we'll have a holy trinity. Maybe Slanesh can have some kind of spirit or something, too. Well, um, Slanesh's number is six. Six, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm just making a, a father, son, and Holy Ghost joke. Um, at any rate, the uh, the so yes, yeah, so, so you know that portion of Slanesh is out, and they kind of talked about the impact of that and the return of the Geld Prince. That is to say, of of the of Sigvald, and uh, you know, I mean, it did didn't say much. The important part about them releasing that article was Mm -hmm. that that told me, okay, cool, you're going to announce the pre-order on Sunday for next Saturday, right? So, like, calendar-wise, I guess that would mean, what, the 7th or something? I don't know, whatever this Sunday is. I think that's right. Sunday, Sunday, not, not, uh, not Valentine's Day. Correct. Well, no, the pre-order would be on the 13th. Which will be Valentine's oh. Day weekend. Oh yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Because it's the, they do okay. the whole Sunday yeah. announcement. They're like yeah. we know this Sunday, this coming Sunday is an announcement for a pre-order that will go up the next week because that'll be the two weeks the next week. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So and it is. So, so it will be Valentine's Day. Yeah, and and so like that just makes sense because the trick is oh, if you miss maybe. that, then the next pre-release weekend is the twenty seventh, and I just doubt where they're going to push all the way to the end of the month. They wouldn't have started doing a lore article, or they wouldn't have started an article series. Now, if this was going to go on for literally another month, right? Well, I mean, they did that with Lumineth, but yes, I understand what you're saying. Sure. So, um, so my guess is, this is purely purely guess, based yeah. on them releasing that article, is that this is, like, we've seen them gin up this marketing like this before. Yep. Right? Yep. You start with the very soft lore articles... And then Sunday they announce that the pre-release will be the next Saturday, the thirteenth. Then we spin into like the rules preview articles, right? And then we get the the actual pre-release. And then the next week we get into the hard articles of like showing painted models and yeah, yeah, and and deep dive stuff. Yes. Do you think we'll get the the doc book the same weekend? Yeah, that's what they said. The the original article said they're coming out the same time, so I assume they'll both go on pre-order together. I, I predict that whenever week, whatever week that happens in, will be a very expensive week for me. 
<laughs> I predict that with a hundred percent certainty. Not for myself. I will. T I'll take a book, please. Sure, sure. Just one. Wait, you're not gonna get the endless spells. You're gonna get them, uh, Doc. Yeah. Endless spells. Don't play yeah. like you're not. Don't play like you're. Yeah. Not. Yeah. I mean, they could be bad. Like I have a box. I have multiple boxes of endless spells that are literally just sh sitting on the shelf, never, never. But to been you open. know you need them because if one of them gets good, you're gonna be like, I want that. And oftentimes, endless spells will just suddenly get good when they drop by twenty points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Um, yep. Uh, so that's coming, Slanesh. Yep. Uh, we have a White Dwarf preview. FEC's getting some love with the Tome Celestial. Yes. And Anvil of Apotheosis. For, focused on death people. So, okay. The uh, Anvil more, of Undeath more rules. Undeathiosis. Yes, more rules for Anvil of Apotheosis, just in general. I yeah, am sure. in. That's fine. That's great. Though. I think it's fun narrative stuff. Yeah, the tome will contain, they also mentioned it has like some FEC versus uh, OBR battle plans. And I was like, I don't care. Because I don't really care about those kinds of special battle plans that are yeah, specifically yeah, built and tailored to two very specific armies. Right? Yeah. I like narrative yeah. battle plans yeah. if they have a sort of generic nature to them of like they're meant to be used with any two armies, but you're doing a narrative thing, right? right. Army A is trying to accomplish something, Army B is trying to stop them, whatever. Cool beans. I just don't tend to care about the ones where it's like it uses a bunch of rules that are very specific to one army, especially to two armies I don't own. <laughs> right. Right, right, right. But yeah, I'll, I'll um, be interested to see what they do with FEC and what new rules they give them. It's clearly meant to represent the particular Charnel Kingdom that Archon is trying to recruit. Here's the question I have for you, Tom. It has been discussed a lot whether or not this spoils Broken Realms, this White Dwarf article. Because in the lead up to the White Dwarf article, it says that Archon is attacking Yumetrica in response to Teclis, like striking out against the Ossiarch Bone Reapers. Okay? Right. And so the question is either is this, was, you know, did because of the release schedules getting moved around, was this White Dwarf supposed to be like Archon's reprisal? for the events of Broken Realms Teclas. Okay. Yes. Or, what I'll say is this. Or but... is this just the lead up? Like, Teclas starts pushing back against the Bone Reapers. Archon says, you know, okay, fine, that's how you want to play it. He goes and invades Yometrica, you know, one of the great nations, right? And then Teclas sees the destruction that's wrought and is like, okay, I see this is for real now. I'm not messing around with you people anymore. I'm going after your boss. Mm, that's a good, good, good. That's a good proposal. My anticipation was is that it's actually. Uh, I think Teclas is gone, doing his thing, doing his mission. That's been uh, promote like suggested is what he's going to do, mm -hmm. and and <laughs> Archeon's like awesome. I'm in, you know. And he goes after your metrica. Wow, Teclas is gone. That's what my guess is, because, yeah. because like this is providing some background as to what happens when Teclas is doing his own thing. Okay, that's my guess. We'll see. So, but yes, uh, that's, I, that's that would coming. be really disappointing if he if Teclas is going after Osiarch, because like I wanted him to go into the heart of Shaiish. Like, yeah, I we want, want him to go. go. Like we've been promised a showdown at the OK Corral here, right? Right at the Black Pyramid. Yes, I I like that's what I want. Uh, Teclas, by the way, in this is absolutely wider, even though I don't like Texas, te Teclas, sorry, I like Texas just fine. I don't like Teclas, uh, I still would, I still would rather him be the, he's still the protagonist over Nagash. Sorry, that's just how this is. Yeah, I would love, like, because the reason why I think Archeon has the freedom to go after Yometrica is because I think Teclas is completely bound with what he's doing. Sure. Like, because if Teclas is just next door, if he's in the all points, right, messing with the uh, OCR that's there, that's not going to be enough. No, and that's, that, like I said, that's why I hope that um, that we have uh, a real good, solid punch up here. Like, what we want to see is a, cl is a climactic showdown. That's what we want. Yeah, I am not going to be surprised if Teclas just punches a hole in the Shaiish gates to the all points and saunters right on through. <laughs> sure. 
I, well, you know what I don't want? The end of season one of Heroes. <laughs> That's what I don't want. <laughs> don't have them if they're, they were about to fight and then we close the door and we just throw some flashing lights underneath. No. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> yeah, you remember oh, that yeah. letdown? Oh, man, you didn't have to say that. Sure. Just so much build up. Mm-hmm. So much build up. Save the cheerleaders of the world. It's a bad show. What else we got? <laughs> um... Uh, you know, I'm going to jump uh, to another, a different item than on our list. You can do these in uh, whatever order you like, Tom. You're the master nope. of the news. Uh, so uh, we had a AOS tangential thing, news dropped today in an article, of a new board game called Bladeborn that's for Warcry. But boxed in it are two of the Underworld's warbands. Mm-hmm. Um yep. And like a lot of people were like, oh, big crossover. You know what? You know what this is? This is just a cheap, quick and dirty intro box to Warcry. That's yeah, all this 100%. is. This is a starter war box. It's probably its retail is $60, um, which is basically the cost of both war bands. Sure. <laughs> plus the cardboard that you need. And in fact, it would be cheaper just to buy the war bands than to buy this box game. That doesn't matter. Um <laughs> And uh, I'm going to buy it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it seems like a great intro uh, Warcry set. I mean, that's what it is. It's just an intro Warcry set, right? Oh, the bright side of it is it will likely bring the rules for either some or all, or we will get all, of the oh, uh, Underworld's Warbands in Warcry, which is fantastic. How amazing would that be if we got everybody? Yeah, and, um, and yes, it's on hexes, unlike normal Warcry, but again, that's because it's the intro game. It's also flat, with no, like, vertical terrain to speak of in the right. traditional sense, right. because that's how because they always do intro games, because intro games are meant to be very straightforward and require you to have basically nothing else besides what's there in the box to play. Right, and so you get no terrain, because probably they're going to use terrain tiles like they do with Underworlds, mm-hmm. because that's how Underworlds does terrain. Um, so they're going to have terrain tiles and they're doing hexes because they're invoking the under, like they're trying to pull Underworld's community folks into Warcry. That's what's going on here. Yeah, this is called the next step. This is the next step on your gateway journey, right? Like you right. got into Underworlds because it's simple and it's four figs and it's card like game. And they're like, okay, well, hey, we got another game that uses cards. They, they're they they're different and it's more of some dice and stuff. But here's a simple same game. Models. Where you can, same models. You can just play this, and while you're getting into Warcry, then you're going to get into Warcry, and you're going to start buying more chunks of armies, and then eventually, you just buy a whole army. Why not just play and, AOS? Right. You know you know those uh, those warbands that are fighting each other? They're in the same army in AOS. So if <laughs> exactly. you buy that, you, play them you have them. like, you put them together, you have like 200 points. You're basically AOS. there. You're basically at an army. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Maybe 300. Uh, so, yeah, I'm excited about this product. I love products like this. I love when they do the intro stuff. I, and not just because you get cheap models. Um, like, I love, uh, I love what it does for our community. It gives options. Mm-hmm. Sure. Can we talk about the, the, while we're on this subject, obviously, the, the Ravagers, what you're talking about. The, they, we saw their War Scroll as well. Yep. Which is the, the four Chaos warrior well i guess three chaos warriors and the uh, chaos sorcerer or whatever uh the sisters and their two friends basically mm-hmm. and uh did you catch the points on them no i didn't so uh, they're fine like as a war scroll as, as per usual as an underworld's war band like let me fine. guess uh they're 80 points no they are not um because i mean it's it's decent enough for what all they can do they're oh, wait, 100... let me 130? You're so close. 125. Exactly right. 120. Okay. Yeah, I remember. Uh, yeah, I remember. Uh, yes, because it, it, was the fi- it was the five that caught my eye because we've not had five point increments. Exactly. Yeah, I actually had this conversation with somebody else, Nico, in fact. Um, I think that this is the spoiler for to AOS 3.0 that we're going to go into five point increments. Yep. Yes, as as Goob said, Kagra's Kagra's pals. Yes, it's like, you know, yeah, Kagra and her, and her pals. Yes, uh, I yes. do not want five point increments. Get out of here with this. I nonsense. think we're at five point increments. Oh my 
god. And here they are. So dumb. Oh. Yeah, if look, if it wasn't fair at 130, 125, it doesn't matter. Okay? It doesn't matter. It's just not how games are. It's just not. It's not the way the game works. What we need here is not fi a more fine-tuned balance on five-point increments. That's not what was keeping Beasts of Chaos at forty-one percent or whatever. Okay, we need to are rewrite you, War Scrolls. Are you ready for loadouts to have their own pointing? No, I mean no. Get out of here with that crap. That's never going to happen. That's not happening. It like it just won't. It just won't, because there's no reason they would push to that. Uh, unless you, you mean, like, in the broadest did, sense of how it already Did occurs. you think that there would be uh, pointing with, um, we'd go to five-point increments? No, but I still don't know we are. It's just possible that literally they made this one thing like that. Again, let me, let me no propose way. to you a world. There is, there is no way. There are enough people who touch that war scroll. That nobody looked in that and went, why is this on fives? Tom, they put up the big winner FAQ, and two of the point scrolls were from the last GHB. What the holy hell are you talking about? There's no way. No, but the problem is, I understand that. That's that's FAQ. That's like correcting problems. Uh-huh. We're well, no, 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 no. But you're going to have less people touching that than from all the way from design through development and playtesters and all that. Like, I'm sure playtesters would have looked at that and went, we have no other fives. Uh, right? yeah. like, because this is five. Whatever. That's the amount it came to. We felt like trying it out. You know, I don't know. Like, look, maybe it will, maybe it won't. I'm I'm saying if you ask me, sure, 60 40, they'll go to five point increments, which I think is dumb. Okay. I'm just not saying that there's no way that you immediately fall down the slippery slope beyond like what you're what you already have when the loadout is like, so relatively so different that it actually have, like, necessitates three loadouts for chaos orders. Right? Hypothetically, sure. we have three loadouts for chaos. Sure. Warriors. Yeah. What I'm you you go to you basically go to three entries based on like sword and sword and board, halberd, and uh great weapon or whatever. No, no. Unless you literally rewrote the war scrolls to make them so different that they ended up like Kurnoth Hunters. Like Kurnoth Hunters have three separate scrolls and three separate they points, do. right? They but do. that's because those those weapon loadouts are so different as to necessitate like literally individual balance. Right. And maybe some some war scrolls, they need that and some don't. I don't know. I'm just saying it wouldn't surprise me if we are moving towards more fine tuning. One way to do that is to put lo to, to lower the increments. Another way to sure, do that sure. is, is to tweak loadouts. Uh huh. You know, you know what you have to do before you fine tune? Tune. I got it. Yeah, there you go. Correct. Correct answer. Okay, like, and I'm not trying to be a jerk here. Like, I'm just saying. I, I'm trying not to take shots at the at the at the team. I'm not either. I'm. But here's my point. You got low hanging fruit. Okay, it's literally like reach up. There's these ripe apples you can pluck called war scroll fixes. Okay, allegiance ability fixes. These are low hanging fruits. Five point increments. That's at the top of the tree. You had to get out a ladder to get to that one. Okay. No, well, this we is got a I'm lot of fruit we can we may have a new edition. This is why I'm saying we have, might have a new edition is because they're like, well, if we're moving to to a new edition and we're going to tweak these other things, maybe we should redo the system because this is like the key with five point increments is that you're actually getting into the nuts and the bolts of how like the whole system is designed to interact with one another when you go to fives, sure. okay? And so my per, my my uh, premise is that I think. If we're moving to fives, that talks about systemic changes, like the addition of endless spells in second edition. That type of like that type of systemic change. Maybe. Uh, my my point is, it's there's no need for it. You already aren't getting balance. Like my point is, the dividend that would pay is not equal to the complexity. Every I design understand. change you make has a cost, a good and a bad. That's true for every game element you add. You know this. I'm explaining it to the audience. Okay, That's so the the point is is that okay? What do you buy? You buy some amount of ability to adjust points in a more fine granularity. Way. What you lose is complexity in building. Okay, you lose like like you end up with more complexity in making individual points work, in making units balance properly because now you can be wrong in different ways slightly. So you're constantly chasing the dragon. You add to your quote unquote technical debt 
of game design. Because now you have complaints about it being five points wrong one or the other direction. And now, if you move it that much, you're really doing nothing. We already think ten-point moves do nothing. Welcome to five-point moves, which will really do nothing. That's half of nothing. Okay? So, at any rate, but this isn't the show tonight. It's going to be so amazing for people like me who like to go in and, like, list tune and like adjust and i'm like okay i need five more what if i do this yeah what's next and move these uh-huh. two around what's next okay what's next? um what's next uh something that's not aos related hello dear hi is owen what? jackson here no he's not here tonight <coughs> it's just tom i know i know we were all late down. i know it's no fun <laughs> It's so funny that Kathy does a great job of interrupting the Please most subscribe! important moment of the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is, we had the most amazing thing that I argue is even better than these doggos. That's not true, but go ahead. Keep talking. It is true. The okay. trailer for Total War 3 Warhammer oh, God. came out. Total Sorry, War Warhammer now. 3 came out. And it's amazing. It has polar bears. <laughs> And Zarina, and it's amazing. Oh, he wants me to go. No, I'm bye. Tom's not interesting. It's the barking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever. Bye, bye. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that trailer was so hype. It was so hype. Like, and I know you were not as hyped as I was, Vince. Mm-hmm. Like, no, I loved it. I loved every. You know how many times I watched. I watched that trailer a lot today. Okay. Like, and it for me it harkens back to like the feeling I got on like the city invasion trailer for Warhammer: Age of Reckoning, or the or the warrior priest chaos warrior fight, uh, for a war. Like those trailers, like it simply doesn't get much better than that. Cool. I mean, do you want me to rain on your parade? I don't know what I don't know what you're wanting here, Tom. No, no. You're leaving space for me. I don't care about gameplay trailers that have nothing to do with actual gameplay in a video game. You mean so, you mean not gameplay trailers? You mean yeah. cinematic trailers? I, thank you. Yes, I don't. I don't care about cinematic trailers that have nothing to do with actual gameplay. Like that's cool. And that's fine. Uh, it was an amazing three minutes. No, I and... am going to talk about something, Tom. Hold up. Hold the phone. We're going to have this conversation right now. We're left turning. Here we go, everybody. Ready? Here's what that trailer made me think. I didn't really like it. I don't care. I don't like Total War. Whatever. If you do, and I know it's very popular, I'm sure it was a great trailer for you. The Tsarina is cool, and as an ice queen, she's cool, and bears are cool and all that. Whatever. Fine. Here's what I'm talking about. Yeah, they're great. Okay. Here's what I want to talk about. In that trailer, the Tsarina, like, marches all. She's B.A., Right. She walks out of her tent. She's like summoning up ice and stuff. And then she walks up that little hill as all her people are fighting demons and whatever. And she gets to the top of that little crest. And she like stares down this bloodthirster and like makes little icicles. And I'm like, okay. Five seconds later, she's splatted on that rock. Like, I don't care. That's irrelevant. She's dead. Okay. Because no, I'm. She's, a... she's awesome. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. One. I don't think that's actually what would happen in the game. I'm pretty sure she'll just get killed by the oh, bloodthirster in the game. I know itself. where this conversation's going. I know yes, where this conversation's do. going. Yeah. And two, why? That's not how heroes work. Like, okay, so she is effectively some kind of five wound wizard hero, right? In AOS terms, sure. In AOS terms, put her into melee with a bloodthirster and see what happens on the other side. And bloodthirsters aren't the scariest monster, but he's going to make paste out of her, like that. And what that got me thinking about was the fact that we have no, no, like, for lack of a better term, archetypical badasses in this, uh, in this game, in AOS. This is something that I realized. This occurred to me. What I mean by that is a hero on foot who is capable of killing much larger things than themselves with relative, like, you know, reliability. Okay? There's there's one exception, but continue. Yeah, the one exception being Gotrek, right? Who can splat his way through basically the entire table if he gets up to him. 
And he's pointed appropriately. And he's pointed appropriately. And that's just it. We, the, the reason is because everybody's saying Gotrek. Yes, I understand Gotrek exists, people. Jeez, old beats. Um, I was I was getting there. Give me a second. <laughs> Literally, it's just like but this is an arc. Saying but, Gotrek. I'm aware Vince's of Gotrek. Is that, Vince's point, though, is that this is an archetype. Yes. Okay. This is and absolutely we have one an archetype. One instance of it, I'll give you one and a half, because the only other close one in the game right now is maybe the Light of Eltharion, right? And as I was thinking about this, what occurred to me is, why don't we have more of these, like, three or... Like, take these foot heroes. There's ways to make them survivable and have them be, like, three or four hundred points, right? Where you can actually do that. Everything right now, if you want to be a, like, super Billy B.A., you got to get on top of some big monster. That's the only way people get that awesome and yet this is a you can have an artifact absolutely this is a super classic archetype by the way like the oldest of archetypes this is gilgamesh this is hercules this is david and goliath this is saint george killing the dragon this is john wick like this is a five thousand year archetype okay where it's this singular human who because of like grit and skill and whatever right uh they are capable of of just walking up and doing the dirty business and taking out giant monsters and felling them and yeah there's a reason why we don't take the slaughter queen on foot right right exactly and so all these heroes on foot are all supposed to be like legendary killers and it just doesn't... We don't have any heroes like that. And somebody already mentioned one of the things I wanted to be like this. The monster that should be like... Yeah, thank you, Beowulf is another one. I mean, like, literally, there is... This is a hero with a thousand faces. Like, there are so many examples of this this archetype and trope in mythic and epic fiction and, and such. At any Anakin rate, Skywalker. Sure. Sure. Uh, I want... So, so what I want is... I want the Night Quester to be moved up to, like, 350 points. Okay, and I want him to be Go this guy, on. and I want him to put out that level of pain and have that level of survivability on five wounds. You can three math damage, it out. Three damage attacks, neg three rend, eight only attacks. takes one damage, eight attacks, only takes one damage, and uh, can um, unrendable and an after save. Sure, like, yeah, go nuts. I mean, there's a hundred ways you could construct this type of thing, right? Yep. And so, like, I want to have... And, and the mortal realm seems so suited to this. It's literally mythic fantasy, right? Right. Where you and you have don't have these... any of these mythic people who aren't riding monsters. Right. Like, if you put the person on foot against the guy on the monster, they lose every time, basically, right? Unless they're Gotrek and 50% of the time the Light of Eltharion, depending on what he's sitting across from, right? I think the closest opportunity we have for something like this is, is Sigvald. Uh, maybe he'll be good enough. Maybe he won't. Who knows? But he I mean, he's on a hundred. Like he's like he's on. A don't 60 let that. Is he on a sixty? Yeah, that was what they. That was what was in the picture. It was a sixty. Yeah, you could tell by what was near him. Yeah, I don't know. Like that still doesn't feel small. Sure, it's like it, that. I understand. It's like big. Yeah, but I mean, the, to be fair, the um, Chaos Lord uh, with the Chaos Lord of Corn with Doggo is also on a sixty mil. I mean, it's yeah, I mean, a, a hundred mil is not a lot larger, and that's Nagash. Well, like, actually, it's quite a bit larger in, in in space because that's actually it's the whole like you can fit two 10 inch pizza, 14 inch pizza. You know how you know how diameter works. I do know how diameter works. Thank you. Uh, the point being that like the space on the table that it's taking up, like it doesn't feel a lot larger. Right. There, there just feels like there's this is a space that they could explore with these like epic heroes who are so good at their job. You could spread these around factions. Like I could construct an archetype like that. You could see a corn hero getting to that level very easily, right? Just like some epic slaughterer. You could see yep. uh, an elvish hero Daughters like Eltharian getting there. You could see a daughter of Cain, you know, slaughter queen getting up to that level. Like you can pick something out of most factions that would seem to fit this. Right? right, and yet they don't exist because I think they look at the model and literally go, "If it's smaller, it has to be weaker," because they're eyeballing yep. it off the model. And so, with the the only exception being Gotrek, where they where they really broke the rules wide open, right? Because, because of, like because and the narrative was driving that. Yeah, because it's Gotrek. So at any rate, I want to see them make some super BAs, like because what I want the end of that trailer to be is the Zarina 
spiking that bloodthirster like a football, right? right. You want to see her like put her hands up and like giant like cuffs and chains of ice form around his hands and his legs and just wrench him to the ground and then spikes fly ice like spikes fly out of her and shred his wings off and he falls down onto his feet and then just like as he's down there on the ground just one massive spike of ice shoots up out of the ground behind him and plunges right through the center of him and it just erupts in flame and rhyme fire as he slides this bloody mess down the back of this this thing by the way hire me to, to storyboard your trailers i'll do a great job that would have been way cooler but that's not the situation that's going to happen. Instead, she's just dead. <laughs> in the game or in AOS, she's just dead. So, shame. Anyway, that's what I wanted to talk about. That was a tangent, but it was really bothering me. <laughs> like, a So, Cafe's going to be in uh, Total War Warhammer 3, too. Yeah, cool stuff. That's exciting. Like, it, it'll be neat to see treatment of these. I had said to some of uh, some of our friends... That I feel like uh, it's clear, like it's coming, becoming clear that the old world project that began brewing seems to be on a similar development cycle, like at least starting with like conceptual stuff and art, art resources and stuff like that. And they have kind of alluded to this. Um, it seems to correspond a little bit with the Total War 3. Like there seems to be some degree of overlap there. So it's a really fascinating, um, impl- you know, like one of the implications of that being like, I just wonder how much when they saw how how much of a hit like how much of a hit how much of a cause is there between the old world project mm-hmm. and what has happened with with uh um total war you ever seen a venn diagram where the two circles completely overlap yeah sure like yes because obvi right i mean right. and and also by the way i love seeing things like Cathay and kislev and this kind of art and them working together and that being the thing and what we're going to explore because my honest answer is if you're going to do the old world, you better explore stuff like this. If you just rehash the same tired, not Europe concepts and don't explore these other things that were in your world that we always wanted armies for and never got, what are you even doing? Why even do this project? Well, and I think they had to earn it. I know that sounds really weird, but it feels like they had to like cover their bases with one and two mm-hmm. so that they could do the demons, which that's fine. Uh, Cathay, and I'm, 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 I can't wait to actually hear the story of what's going on. Mm-hmm. Of Kiss Love and Cafe holding back the demonic hordes of the North. Um, and then uh, those two. And you know what? My What I'm anticipating for the free bonus faction. Because they, like, they always have a pre-order faction that you get for free. Sure. Um, I suspect we'll see uh, Cast War Force. Hey, that, that's put that's they, like I think that like it could be Ogres. But I suspect that it'll be Chaos Dwarves. Or at least we will get them with the first expansion if they're not... If, if Ogres are the, the launch army. Sure. All right. Excited. Wait, what, what, one more news item? A long Actually, news you know, I take that back. Uh, Ka- uh, Ogres will be the launch because of the winter stuff. The ever Like, the, oh, the, the winter... Yeah, like, the Ogres overlap too much in that space. Um, but... The cast wars will probably be the first expansion back, like the Tomb Kings for Total War Two. Sure, that's what I'm calling. It. Okay. Um. Uh, we have some news. Um, uh, and then finally, no, that's it. No, we have one, one idea. More. Boom! The Soulbound Bestiary got announced with this wonderful oh, picture yeah. of the Mega Gargant with his dog. <laughs> <laughs> with his with his uh, proud uh, puppo. Yeah. This, if you saw the scene where my dog was climbing on me just a few minutes ago, like. Everybody was talking about how it looks like the the dog brought him the stick and he's like yeah. pet, picking up. No, no, this is I've seen this scene. You just saw it happen right there. Like my dogs are very aggressively affectionate, as you just saw. So aggressively yes, affectionate. absolutely. Yes. So this is just the giant trying to keep his dog from assaulting his new friends. This, these, his four friends came over to visit him here, and the dog is trying to like jump on them. And when you have a giant, like, ma- I'm so excited! Yes. I'm so excited! When you have a giant magma droth as a pet, like you got to hold him back, right? So he's just like, "I right, come on, behave yourself, behave yourself. I'm gonna whack you with a stick." Like that's what's going on. Uh, a good boy. Yeah, he is. He's a, this little magma droth's a good little boy. Uh, I do love the very brave Endrin Rigger up there. <laughs> just yeah. up in the corner. That dude <laughs> just is going bold. in. <laughs> this, that dude's about to get golf swinged out of the sky. 
Uh, so yeah, new bestiary for Soulbound. That's cool. Um, I found it pretty easy to make monsters in Soulbound when I ran my own game because you can literally just take any of the monsters and pretty easy. Monsters are a pretty simple construction in the game. Reskin them. Yeah, you just yeah. like reskin them and it's pretty straightforward. You add like one relevant special ability and call it a day. Uh, but I'm happy to see this because I think, you know, people like that kind of stuff. You know, just like they announced, oh, later in the year we'll do destruction and death heroes. And I'm like, why? Just it's one special ability for your for your race. It's not a hard thing. But I guess some people like archetypes. I don't know why. But uh, that's how some people like to play. So more power to them. Great game. Okay. That's the news. Boy, oh boy. There we go. Long news section. But that's all right. Uh, so, Tom. Let's get to some pick of the week. Uh, what do you want to share with everybody today, Tom? Uh, you know what? I'm gonna. I'm just gonna do it. Uh, the Total War Warhammer trailer. We're sure. gonna link it. That's fine. Put it in the comments, yeah, yeah, because I love that thing. I have no issue with that. I understand why. I get why some people like it so much. It just didn't hit with me because I don't care. But I'm not gonna rain on your parade. Uh, my pick. Uh, by the way, GW. I know you're watching. Mm -hmm. you can come over to camera too. Um. There's a really great opportunity here. These wonderful cinematics that we've had for these games for all these years. You know, you've you've launched uh, uh, an animation studio. Why don't you give us some like ten to fifteen minute shorts? Yeah, of some 100%. of these stories. We need like a love. What was it? Love, death, and robots, or whatever. That that we need that kind of an animated special, right? With just the fifteen minute shorts, but like set in the mortal realms, It'd be amazing. Yeah, yeah, oh, and even the old world. Like, I would love to see, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity here. That's all I'm saying. Sure. Um, and I want to see more as arena. And uh, tell then and be able to tell my kids that the trailer for Frozen 3 just came out. Yeah, that's, gosh darn it, that was the other joke I wanted to make. Shoot! I forgot about <laughs> it. My response to you was going to be, I tried to keep that in the bag. My response to you was going to be, yeah, I thought that trailer for Frozen 3 was pretty weird. But yes, at any rate, you got it. All right, my pick of the week. Uh, so Honest Wargamer Rob is back to doing his breakfast battles, which are a lot of fun. So if you want to watch some TTS, we talked about TTS last week. If you're interested and on the fence, you can watch a game be played. And today he uh, played Adam Mumford, and he is running Night Haunt, which is great. Uh, I know there's a lot of Night Haunt fans out there. And Tom, Adam Mumford ran Spider Fang today. Awesome. Uh, so it was Night Haunt against Spider Fang. Uh, I will not. I will not spoil the outcome of the game. But they were playing on Scorched Earth, so the you know eight uh, objectives. Um, cool. so it was a real fun I, game. You want to see them spiders hey, in action? I, uh, I, uh, Brew City, um, Brawl. I was chatting and uh, reading their pack, and they're twenty five hundred points. And I was like, you know, I could take twenty five hundred points of spiders to Brew City. <laughs> Just so many spiders. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All, all the spiders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'd be like fighting. As the, you're just you're just mobilizing like Australia to go to war. Yes, absolutely. Done. Okay. Uh, yeah. So check that out if you want to see the spider fang engage with the night haunt. It's it's uh it was a fun, fun uh, breakfast battle. So very cool. And Adam's a very funny guy. Uh, partway through the game, he started just like grabbing other assets and setting them on the table to see if Rob would notice like a croak on a bale wind just showed up randomly. And uh, stuff like that just started popping into the game. So, yeah, it was a good time. All right, let's talk about some hobby time. So, hobby time. Uh, Tom, what's been on your uh, your table this week? Uh, well, I've been exploring some additional hobby space. Okay. Um, and so uh, a lot of my hobby time has been house hunting. Sure. Uh, but... Uh, uh, I'm prepping for this weekend. Uh, I'm making the drive up to Columbus. Mm -hmm. And Vince and I are going to throw some dice this weekend. So yes. I've been prepping for that. It's going to be an intense weekend. Many games will be played. It's going to be a good time. Uh, for myself, since I don't really have a current army project, I'm trying to focus on things that I find fun or interesting. You can't really see it, but right here there's a big piece of terrain uh, that's over there prepped to be painted that I'll probably make a video about. And since everybody's talking about, uh, 
you know, since there was a big discussion about Vampirates, I got this model out, which is a uh, 54 millimeter pirate lady. And uh, I'm doing her like a vampire. And she's going to be in like this very cold moonlight. And she doesn't show up well here, but you can see sort of the light on that side and the darkness on that side. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy with how she's coming along. Uh, she's a lot of, a lot of fun. Uh, old mini I've had for a while, and I just wanted to get out and paint it, and I just I couldn't. Yeah, I'm actually happy enough with how she's coming out. It's a fun experiment in incredibly muted colors. Like I'm trying to to really desaturate everything down because she's in faint moonlight, right? Um, so there you go. Uh, okay, Tom, my friend. Are you ready to get into the negative play experience survey? Man, we've been trying to define this for a really long time. We have. So let's talk about NPE. Before we get into the results of the survey, what's your feelings about sort of NPE, right? Like, how, how do you think of it? I know you've looked at the survey, but 40,000 foot view. What do you see this as being? Not just how, what is it to you? I'm saying, what is it in concept? Uh, I don't think it exists. Okay. MPE is only it, there aren't bad rules, just bad players. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, I, I mean what I'll say is this: there, uh, it for me, MP, MPE has only um, has has. I mean, by definition, is a negative play experience, sure. and more often than not, to me, most play experiences can be resolved through information. Okay. Not not exhaustively, but most of the time, there are things that can be done if you are aware of them. But sometimes those things have to be started like the list building phase. Sure. So, yeah. Which can be not fun if you want to play a specific list, right? If you're not willing, like, right. if, you, if you have things you love and right. want to play, then that can make you more or less likely to find NPE. I think one of the, the challenges in defining what a negative play experience is, is that to me, there's always been so many differing opinions on it, right? right. And right. even sort of trying to put any kind of box around this concept is just really yep. hard because people play this game and see this game in lots of different ways, right? They play for lots of different reasons. We've talked about psychographic profiling before. You know, you got the old Johnny Timmy Spike and all of that. But in addition, yep. there's just a lot of different reasons why people enjoy or don't enjoy a game, right? Game to right. game. You mentioned their particular list could be a horrible matchup. There could be particular rules or rules interactions. The dice could go against yeah. them. like, And that could sort of color how they perceived the efficacy of the other army, right? Yep. Um, so there's just lots and lots of, of sort of conflicting concepts going on here. That's why I really wanted to do this survey, because I wanted to get to the idea of like, OK, let's get to the actual bottom of this. Right. <laughs> like, sure. I mean, if it's possible, sure. If it's possible, let's see if we can try to draw some kind of conclusions around right. what the heck we're all talking about, because it seems like we, we say it. Most of us feel it. Right. And yet it's so elusive to define okay so with that being said it's powerpoint time folks that's right all right let's go into so that's going to cover up tom and i you can't see us anymore but that's all right uh let me go ahead and put this into powerpoint mode swap views minimize that now i can see us okay so negative play experience i, I like this cover by the way do you get what i'm referencing with the cover of the uh of the survey tom uh nope Okay, with with uh, the first page. So obviously Lord Croak, right? That's that's who's over on the left. Oh, and then the middle one is uh, the uh, Lumineth. Yes, exactly. That was the tricky yes. one. Yes, total eclipse. Yes. Like just yes. the worst. Yeah. Okay. Do you, do you like not using your command point? Excellent. <laughs> do you Let like me introduce shutting off an entire mechanic of your army? Yeah, great. Oh uh, no, no, no. A tire mechanic of the core game. Of the core game, yeah. Whoever designed that spell, it's bad, and you should feel bad. Okay, that's literally what I'll say about that spell. <laughs> okay, 
So let's get into it. First, just a quick overview of the survey. There were 785 respondents. A little less than I liked, but that's okay. If you didn't respond, that's on you. Yeah, but that's all right. Uh, respondents selected the armies they played in a multi-select. So unlike the previous ones we've done, uh, players where, where I forced people to pick a particular army, you know, to say like this yep. was your one army. Yep. This time we allowed people to multi-select all the armies they play. Uh, the bar here that I set was if you had experienced NPE in at least one game in the last two years, that was not, and I emphatically re re repeated this on every single question where it was asked, that was not dependent on facing a bad player or bad, you know, not, uh, uh, someone who was a jerk, basically. Right? Right. It is the mechanics of the army or the game, not of the, the player. player. Yes, absolutely. Uh, respondents indicated the items they felt were a negative play experience in a multi-select and were also allowed to leave general comments boy oh boy were there a lot uh i went through all of them i picked a very small selection we'll review here at the end here um yep. i'm going to try to find a place to put up the raw data of all of the surveys we've done so if other people want to take them and take a look at them and you know find their own do their own data synthesis uh that's fine okay so yep. um you can look through all the verbatims obviously everything's anonymized i never know who is responding to anything none of this is and and what i'll post up will be filtered out even from anything like that it'll just literally be the answers so okay um so nobody will ever know what anybody said i can't see what you said i don't know who took any survey i never asked for people's name or anything like that uh so nothing like that all right first off let's get into one of the most interesting things that came out of this and it was the first question okay mm -hmm. so armies played now remember this like if you look at this it totals to way more than 785 right i mean right because yep. again people can multi-select here right yep but this one just fascinated the living bejesus out of me okay That's so good yep because <laughs> here we go Let's really take a look at what this means. Again, people were allowed to select every army they played. Let's look up here. Stormcast Eternals, Cities, Slaves to Darkness, Nighthaunt, Oryx, Gloomspite, Maw Tribes, Skaven, right? So, like, all of these, the top part of this, right, mm -hmm. the top chunk of this list yep. are all of the fat middle, middle-performing yeah, yeah armies yep right yep. uh it is and then uh, you can we can even keep going down right like legions maggotkin blades right then you could get you in... go ahead could you pull the data on how many people played multiple armies yeah 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 the answer is a lot <laughs> but yes i do have that i can like, pull that data I just wonder if, like a lot of people started with fat metal armies and then picked up a second army that's better well, and so what's interesting is as you go down the list, you get into all the broken stuff, right? Right. Like right. Disciples, Flesh Eaters, Ossiarchs, KO, Ideneth, Seraphon. I'm, I'm going to say Lumineth and Sons are mostly exempt here because they could be filling, like, they, they're both very recent, right? So it's yeah. hard to know how real that data is. Very recent armies that just release like that, it's tough. To yeah, say, yeah, because they're still hitting their saturation points. Yeah, you exactly. don't know what their you don't know what their true community saturation is going to be. Yep, daughters, heed knights, right, fire slayers, like what's so? And then like obviously there's this outlier in beasts of chaos, which proves just that like sometimes an army is so bad that yeah. you know if you people remember just won't touch it. people just and won't touch and there's it. old models. Don't worry, like it's mm -hmm. not only are they bad, they also have really old models. And by the way, the best data that we have is Nighthawn is certainly in the fat middle, W. Soren, that it like it still exists within the 40 to 60 percent win rate area. Right. But when you get the the top of the, the like, look, this is the best performing armies. Dot, OBR, KO, Eidneth, Seraphon, Doc, Fire yep. Slayers. The best yep. ones are all in the bottom universally. <laughs> right. Yeah. With Disciples yep. being the highest outlier. Yep right maybe slaves well i mean slaves like, again slaves, is a pretty... slaves has had a real rally maggie can has had a real real rally in recent events sure ish like as, as near as we can tell but again slaves i think most people 
feel is a pretty fair army. Like, yes, Marauders are kind of weird. But, like, the really busted, janky stuff you see, often with Slaves of Darkness models, are happening, like, in Disciples of Zinch, for example, in Host Arcane. Sure. Right? Sure. It's not happening in yep. the Slaves of Legions. Yep. Maybe Idolaters will change all that. But yeah. I, I just found this so fascinating, right? Because the highest competitive armies, and again, there are exceptions, like I said. Like, Beast being weighed on here is clearly just because, one, uh, aesthetically, they didn't score very high, so they're not drawing people in on the models, right? Like, Night right. Hunt, for whatever it's worth, remember, it killed the aesthetic survey. People love these models, right? Yep. yep. And you know beast didn't rank that high on the aesthetics it's clearly one of the weakest armies if not the weakest army currently in circulation right yeah. uh and so but you know there there are exceptions but when you look at this like two things popped out to me from this one competitive armies aren't the things people play the most number right. one they play what they want to paint yeah they they play what they want to paint and they play there is real value here to gw Okay. Yeah. In hitting the fat middle with your armies. Busted armies are played less. The fact that they're played more in the competitive scene is not representative of that army's placement as a whole. Right. That's what these data says. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like very clearly what this data says. That the armies yep. that actually get played and hence by the by get bought are the are, ones that are, people feel have yeah. good aesthetics and sit in the fat middle. Yeah, so the more they design towards the middle, mm -hmm. the more popular an army is. But, like, it's is it correlation, causation? Who knows? Who knows? But I can just, only say they correlate. Yeah. I can't say it's a they direct correlate. cause. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. um, no, it, 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 that is a really striking observation. It is. And, and it so flies in the face of the normal competitive thing of like, oh, GW makes rules busted, so we all buy it. No, <laughs> that's not actually what happens. There is a negative correlation between those two things. Right. Okay. Right. Like, Fire Slayers are often straight impossible for some armies to beat. Okay? Yep. They are at the bottom. Remember, they also scored the worst on the aesthetic survey. People right. aren't buying or playing this army. They're not no. playing it. They don't like its look. They're not buying it. Right? It's like me and it's like me and Kenny and a couple other folks. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, poor Legion of Asgore down there, but again, not a real army. I, I love the drop off of how. <laughs> yes. Womp, womp, womp. So, you know, whatever. Like that's, Well, and now it's really not. Why Legions, it's yes. really not a real army. It's not even on the website anymore. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And it also, as we go on through here, the other thing that I see in this data set is that NPE not only influences people not playing the armies, right? That is to say, being powerful uh, and being like a, 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 a meta breaker not only is negatively correlated with people playing the army, but it has a long tail on it, okay? Hedonites is actually a pretty weak army right now. At the moment, right? At the current right, moment, right. Slanesh is actually a pretty weak army. It's not right. busted. It's not top tabling anything. You're going to have armies that are, you're going to fight in a lot of fights where you just get beaten badly. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yet it still ranks super low. Now, aesthetic wise, it was pretty much in the, in the middle. Like it was fine. People, you know, like it had a pretty strong love hate correlation, right? Yep. If you remember, Nurgle was the dead center of that, but Slanesh yes. wasn't far off. And, like, but Slanesh was so toxic, okay, yep. that it poisoned people's perception of the army. Now, now, why am I saying that beyond just this number? I have to be drawing that for more than this number. I'm drawing that from the, like, 800 verbatims that I read of people leaving comments. Yep. yep. The number of comments that were like, my biggest NPE was I played my the pre-FAQ Slanesh. Yeah. Yep. That was like if I did a word cloud out of it, you know, if I just dumped all of I should have thought about that. I didn't do it, yep. but I should have thought about that. Um if I had just dumped but all the verbatim. Slanesh into a single would be file, huge. Yeah, Slanesh would be huge. Right? Yep. 
So the the point being is that like even though it's had a low, even though it's fallen, these that kind of toxicity has such a right. long tail on it, right? Right. It's poisonous. Yes. It's poisonous to the community. It's poisonous to those armies in the long run. Right. Exactly. Uh, you saw the same thing, by the way, with with Osiarch coming up a lot less, but still came up a lot, right? Right. Of like, I played against Petrifex Elite three up, and my army just bounced off, and then I died. It was the opposite of fun. <laughs> yep. Right. So. Yep. It the this was such a revealing chart to me because what this says to me is that the armies that are popular, the armies people want to play, the armies people buy, the armies people like to play are the ones that are fun and hit the fat middle and they feel like they get good games out of. Which seems yep. pretty obvious. Yep. Right? In general, I, like, in... So, I may, I find myself making distinctions mm -hmm. between games that I'm going to play with friends and what I take to those games and games that I play competitively. Sure. Like, I don't, like... Uh, like Vince, for example, when I showed up to play my KO last summer, yeah, did I bring any endless spells? Uh, no, I don't think you had any spell in a bottle. Nope, I didn't. I just didn't bring it. Yeah, you know, like I took a bunch of Thunderers. Sure. Like because Which, that's the point, right? Yeah, yeah. You play. Like, you also tried a bunch of different lists, and you know, yada yada. Right, because I'm like I'm not trying to beat Vince. Yeah, like, we're just trying to have an interesting game. And I was running wacky, like, all Saurus Seraphon yeah. lists and stuff. With, or, yep, or yep, like, yep, yep. Thunder Lizards with no Bastilodons, right? Just, like, all Stegodons, because let's go. But that's the point, is yeah. that, like, the things that, are, uh, that I'm most likely to field with friends, which are a majority of my games, mm -hmm. are going to be fun lists. They're playful. They're exploratory. You want to play a full game. You don't want to set up your toys and, like, it, you know, you don't want to take that long to set up your toys table them in the first 30 minutes and then go okay well that was fun well what do you want to do now you want to re-rack no they don't want to re-rack yeah. like um <laughs> like mo most players most players that's not you know like yes there are some clubs that that is certainly uh the the norm right. but that's not the majority yeah and so my my point simply being that like it makes sense that like most of the people are playing kind of the fat middle fun armies yep yep all right Let's keep going. I just, I found this chart so fascinating because when I looked at it, I was like, holy crap, it's the exact inverse of yep. the yep. power rankings, right? Yep. It was, it was revelatory to me. Uh, all right. Yep. Let's just go. Let's just real quickly, just to compare to that, by the way, I've got some comparison slides here from the previous survey. Um, yep. This is the armies played from the balance survey where you could only yep. pick one, right? Yep. And so obviously this survey was some time ago, but it still reflects the same thing. Stormcast, Oryx, Magakin, Slaves to Darkness, Ogres, Cities, Gits, all up top, right? The, the the breaker here was this was much closer before the Seraphon book was sort of seen as being yep. what it was. And they've fallen way down, right? With right. with a lot right. more people. Like this, you had the people were picking as primary there. They're not even picking it as playing, right? Right. Blades, Sylvaneth, like, all in all, this is a very similar-ish list. Like, right. when you... Because we did this one, like, a couple weeks after Lumineth launched. Yep, right? yep, yep. So, about nine months ago. And so, to me, it's fascinating that now we have multiple data points, both when I pushed people to identify the single army that they consider themselves a player of. Right. And if I just said, okay, pick all the armies you play, right? Both yep, times... You see similar distributions. We yep. see similar distributions of the the power broker meta-busting armies just being down, yep. being the bottom yep. end of the chart. Never, like, and that means not feeding the sales, not getting played. Again, a tournament meta would warp that, right? One would expect that you, you're going to see that a different spread, but that is why the tournament meta is not representative of quote unquote the the one what's being purchased and two the like meta of you and your friends, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just thought that was interesting because comparing those two, I was like, wow, those are so very similar, right? Yep. All right. Uh, finally, I want to bring back one more thing from the the previous survey because we're going to talk about NPE a lot, and so it would be easy to say that, oh, the game is in a bad place. 
So this is the state of the game. Yeah, this was last survey. year. This was last year. But still, but well, yep. still, I mean, it is relevant for the. It is relevant, and what's relevant is that there are plenty of people who think they're either neutral or negative. But overall, Age of Sigmar being in a good place when we did that survey, only fifteen percent of the people said they disagreed with that statement or strongly disagreed with that statement total. Yep. So I think that's a good sign. Now I don't. But I would love to run this one again at some point. Run these kind of questions, right? Sort of state of the game yep. questions. Uh, the I have a fair matchup, much worse, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I think that's interesting, and we're going to see. Like this has been a year where we've had some strong NPE enter the 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 arena, but it's also a year where we got rid of some of it, as we'll get into. Okay, so. Uh, with high level data out of the way, let's turn to our negative play experience results. Yeah. All right. So experienced NPE, 774 people answered this question. I don't know how 11 people skipped this question. This is fascinating to me that anybody, why do you take the survey and skip the question? If you 11 people, if you're watching this right now, this was a radio button where you clicked one of two things. This was too complicated. At any rate, 774 people answered it. With 71.45% of the respondents saying yes and 28.5% saying no. And remember, yes in this context means that the player has experienced NPE because of an opponent's army at least once in the last two years. I set the bar very, very low. Yeah. Right? That is a very low bar. <laughs> in the last two years of play, have you had one game where you consider where you experienced NPE? Right. Again, directly because of the rules, not because of a bad player. Would you say that you have had that, Vince, in the last two years? Yes, I would. I would have. I, I answered yes to this question. I mean, I took the survey myself. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm one person. My opinion counts. Of course. Of course. Who wouldn't continue? Yeah. I mean, you so, saw. Yes, I answered yes. Yeah. Uh, but here's what I'll say. I was actually kind of surprised by this. And what I mean by that is I was surprised the no was that high. Okay. Like, I don't know if I would answer yes. Like, yeah, I mean, no. Like, I can understand the no's. Let me say that. Yeah. So why? Go ahead. Give, give me your thought on it. Because, again, like, I... <sighs> you're not generally like, someone sensitive to NPE is what you're saying? Like... To you, it's more like, oh, I should have made a different list or I should have played differently or something yes, like that. Like, yes, like I should have thought it or I knew what this was going in. Mm -hmm. Like I knew what the strengths and weaknesses were. So I just accepted what the experience was because I knew what it was going to be before I experienced it. Like sure. I wasn't encountering rules for the first time. Sure. I knew that I wasn't going to get command points when this matchup happened. Okay. Okay. Like I knew that I need to align my things so that I, like even if I get push to fight last in combat i have another reprisal sure i knew like and so that's why i kind of pushed and said you know there isn't you know there isn't mpe doesn't exist you know there are no bad rules just bad players like that, i was being flippant but there is a sense in which like when you have the appropriate expectations you know what you're about to experience um it generally i don't experience it as a feel bad yeah that's fair no i honestly this was higher than i thought i expected this to be like maybe 10 percent you know, if you would yeah. have asked me, right? Yep. Uh, what the yep. who would have answered no? So yep. there are uh, it, it. What that says to me is that a couple of different. Again, I can't. You know, I I can't understand the why of it, right? But I can I can make guesses. So, and the the easiest explanation to me, and again, this is just me constructing a narrative. There's no data to support this, other than that's quite a high number of people who literally in two years haven't played it, haven't experienced, sorry, haven't experienced MPE. Is one, most people probably don't play that much, okay? Like, majority of players probably play once a quarter, once every six months, especially in the COVID times of the last year. That's why I extended it to two years, right? Because right, that included right. 13 months of non-lockdown. Uh, non and so my thought is, one, people might not play that much. Two, a lot of people probably play only with their friends or their friend groups or their club. And in those clubs, there's often an understanding of the types of games and things that they expect. And so they just kind of self-regulate, right? And so yeah. these are people who just have a good group or have a good group of friends or don't happen to play some of the more busted armies by luck or, or intent, 
right? Right, right. And I, you know, because it's when you look at this, what that said to me is there's plenty of NPE that happens. I think we can all that seems prima facie obvious. That's why I'm doing this survey, right? Right. But I was pretty happy with this spread. Um, because overall, I felt like, okay, that's decent. You know, three out of ten people haven't experienced NPE at all who are playing. At all. That's not bad. That's pretty good. Yeah. It's like, I'd want that to be even higher. Like, in a perfect world, I would want that to be flipped. Right? I would right. want those two percentages inverted. But given the state of the game as I perceived it, right. uh, I was actually surprised this was this good. So, at any rate. Uh, let's talk about... So now it's time to start digging into the cross tabs. Oh, let's get into them cross tabs, baby. So, Tom, this slide, I love this slide so much, okay? Yeah, yeah. This slide is NPE experienced by Army. So this is the former question, right? The thing we just yep. asked. We know the aggregate yep. is 7129, basically, right? Yep. Yep. But how does it how does it scale relative to what army you're playing? Exactly. Okay. So yeah. this is the percentage of people by army that have not had NPE. So in other words, this end of the chart, the low end of the chart, means more people who play that army have had NPE, have had a negative play experience. The yep. upper end of the chart means less. Okay? Right. And remember, your median line... Uh, your baseline sits right here, right? In between 28.48 and 29.52, in between Nighthawk and Aussie Arc Bone Reapers. Yeah. Right? That's your median line. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, this is such a fascinating list to me. Okay, who's down at the bottom? Who's Who is experiencing the most NPE? Who feels like they're experiencing it the most? Ogre Maw Tribes, the army without tricks, right? Right. <laughs> By the way, yep. when we get into cross tabs later and we're looking at the particulars, you're going to see in every one it's like ogres, 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 highest, hate this, hate that, hate the next thing. Yes. Because everybody else has tricks and they don't get any. Right? Yep. Um, Sylvaneth, again, pretty understandable. Right? Because it's just like they're, they're in their new form. They're so susceptible to so many of these things. Beasts, yeah. again, completely unsurprising. And then and then Heed Knights, which doesn't surprise me because it is such a one-dimensional army, right? It has, like, right. one way it's played, right. one thing it does. And as we always said, it's very susceptible to, like, high armor, to shooting, to, yeah, to a bunch of stuff, right? There's one anomaly down here that is really curious to me. Oh, then we get into a couple weird ones, which is Eidneth and Fire Slayers, which I love these two showing up. Like, Eidneth, the gatekeeper of gatekeeper armies... That abuses the activation wars, that stops and, and, most the, shooting. and the shooting line of sight, yeah, mm -hmm. and can also alpha strike, right? But these people, these fish people, are just oh, like, I've had some bad else. experiences. Like, are they just entitled to think they're supposed to win? What What is the reason for that? Uh, because I think that they have some fundamental, uh, like, so I would actually say that when we look at things like. Uh, Hedonites, Ideneth, Fire Slayers, Gloom Spite, um, that, those, that stretch of four at least, I would say that there is, there are design issues in the functions of the armies themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Like that there are, there are structural issues mm -hmm. in units and in gaps in the army itself that can't be shored up that MPE gets exploited. Yeah, and so just let me answer a couple of quick comments. So Max yeah. B, NPE for some may mean I lost. I tried as hard as I could through the phrasing of the question, through what I had people identify, through like everything I could to say it's not about losing or a bad player. Now, again, you're right. Some people may take it like that. I can't control what's in people's brains, but I can say I really worked to make this survey well, not measure that. I suspect that it, it corresponds very heavily with games people lost, but what I would add to that is it's also, it's not often that you lose, it's how you lose. Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I, 
you can have NPE in a game you win, and you can right. have NPE in a game you lose. They're they're not they're not directly related, right? They're not they're not right. literally the same thing. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about those folks over on the right, Tom. Shall we? Our what we call the chill group, right? They're like, oh, that's all good. The games games in a great spot. Okay. <laughs> so so <laughs> when I look at daughters Seraphon cities. I'm like, yep. yeah, that checks out. As somebody said, the armies on the right play in more phases often, which I agree. Yep. Like, Seraphon yep. and Cities are both play in every phase, yep. million scrolls, can build 100 armies, can handle any situation, have some way to exploit every kind of NPE rule, right, basically. Yep. yep. Right. And so it kind of makes sense that they're the two least bothered by this. That doesn't surprise me, right? Yeah. With yep. daughters being able to often just weather everything through right. their ridiculous yeah, daughters saves and just bodies. muscle through it. Yeah, they blend through it. Yeah, yeah. The one that really shocked me was Blades of Corn hitting above the benchmark. Now, not much. You know, they're, but some. they're like, it's fine. We'll figure it out. We get yeah. to punch stuff. <laughs> Look, Corn is just laid back. What this tells me is, if you're a Corn player, you're just a laid back person. You're like, whatever. I'm just here to. Do you know what I rest that on, Tom? Like, again, what? this is complete conjecture. Complete yeah. conjecture. Do you know what I rest that, that score on? Blood uh, type. So, blood type? Sure. Blood type. Right, because you're like, you know what? I lost something, but I get a point. Exactly. Corn is this one time they really explored the design, fa the design space that you know I love, where you win something for losing. Right. 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 And it's so fascinating the powerful like dopamine hit that comes from getting a blood point when an, when a unit's destroyed, yours or an enemy's, right? Right, right. And I wish they would realize what a powerful tool they have in that, and figure yep. out some other interesting ways to design that sort of thing, right? Totally, yeah. Because I'm not sure that's what it is. But I'll tell you that, you know, we have a regular corn player in, in my club who plays that army a lot. Yep. And, like, he loses units, and he's like, oh, man. Oh, blood point. And he just, like, you can I can watch him get sad and then happy. Right. He bounces this, right back. Right back. I have, yeah. I have a friend uh, who plays corn here at, at a lo our local club. And it was fun watching him at, in our recent game. Like, he was just, uh, it was a four-player, kind of, like, multiplayer teams. Oh, and yeah. I... And I we just Eiffel Towered him. Sure. Um, and it uh and he like it was a rough game. It was a rough go of it. But you know what he enjoyed doing? Summoning Bloodthirsters. Absolutely. That's what I'm saying, man. Yes. So, so yeah, yep. it, it's just like the 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 I, I don't know if it's the narrative of corn, the people who tend to play corn, the design of corn and getting the blood points. I don't know what it is, but they are an outlier on this right yep yep um so i thought that was interesting uh yeah i just thought this was a fascinating chart it's cool that there's like a 13 point spread and uh like which is a pretty meaningful distribution right yeah yeah and uh what it tells me there is that if you're one of the bottom armies like if you're maw tribe sylvaneth and beasts the fact that you have no tricks means that you feel it all the more when other people have tricks. And what I would say is the next four armies is if there are meaningful holes in your lineup that can be unit, exploited, you feel that. Yes. You people feel that. Drive a right. Mac truck it's like, it. I, I see like fire slayers and I'm just like, oh, somebody's been hit by the mobility tricks. Paul you know, says, like, I'm a corn player who accepts they will lose most games, but demons are still cool. Yeah, see, there you go. That's a corn player right there. I just think corn players are cool people. I think that's what it is. I mean, that's probably that that tracks. Mm -hmm. All right, good stuff. This one that was a, that was a fun cross tabs experiment. I liked that one. Uh, okay, so now let's get into the NPE factors. All right, so I had this to do fascinating. Yeah, this one is here's where we get into the goods. We're getting into that juice, that juicy juice. Okay. Uh, oh, so uh, Red Wizard said, I'm surprised Night Haunt isn't lower. I, again, think people who play Night Haunt just love playing Night Haunt. Their aesthetic rating is so high. 
The I, I, army is highly played. Again, going back to the early things, it was one of the top played armies. I think people just love those ghosts. I love playing Nighthaunt. I do. But I like winning more. Fair. All right. So let's, <laughs> let's talk about NBE factors. Okay. Uh, like, so like, can I... Can I go. Yeah, go ahead. On this go. With yeah. Nighthaunt. Um, when I thought about what I'm taking this weekend to play all weekend with Vince... I consider just taking Night Hawk. That tracks. Because it's fun. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's what I want to do. I want to just go have fun. So. I think that's totally fair. All right. Let's talk about the ranking of NPE factors. Here we go. This is what, let's get into the juice of it, folks. I did not expect this to be the spread, Tom. Did, so let me ask this question. No. Did you, ex like, what on this list surprises you? I mean, everybody can see the numbers on the screen. What on this yeah. list surprises you? Um, <laughs> that high, that high rend was number two uh, from the bottom. Yeah, nobody um, cares about rend. Yep, uh, and that uh, I expected that the hit and wound debuffs would be higher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a lot of surprises in this, okay? Because you know what I hate. I know what you hate. What you I hate, hate rolling a bunch of dice and not doing anything. Exactly, right? So High defenses. So you look here, high amounts of dice rolling, you know, toward the bottom middle at only 16%. Yep. Hit and wound debuffs, neg one, neg two, neg three. Next one up above that. Feel no pain uh, rolls yep. and that kind of thing. Still, again, low. High armor saves, which is something I, I hate, you know, was the highest one out of the things I really hate. Okay. Yep. yep. This section is like what I picked. This is my, be not insta kill, sorry, this section right here. Because yeah. to me, I just hate rolling dice and nothing happening. Like, I play this game because I want stuff to happen. And sure. I learned that I've got some friends, but we're not the most popular group. <laughs> we thought we were the cool yep. kids, we were not. Activation Wars way out above by far the highest one we'll yeah, get into some interesting horrible nuance on that later actually so it's funny that you say that because when i when i was singing through like what my like on the yes no split mm -hmm. the only thing i had to really consider was activation wars yeah like when all the rest of these whatever but activation <laughs> wars were the ones that i went okay like these were bad experiences but what i categorize them as like negative play experiences sure. like things that like just really like crushed me and i'm like no like i knew it was coming in all those instances and so i just planned accordingly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep yeah and so here's here's what's interesting to me activation wars clearly the top next up magical dominance then shooting and then turn one alpha strikes the turn one alpha strikes surprised the heck out of me because yep. i real i like i don't care at all I love when people alpha strike me at the top of one. That's like my favorite thing in the world because every army I've ever built and played is ready for a turn one alpha strike. Right. Like I sure, always have sure. trap walls. I always have some contingency yeah, plans. You're to used to playing me. I, it's just how I think about the game, right? Like sure. deployment is absolutely something I don't list writing. You know, I don't invest a huge amount of time in, but things like deployment, I think about deeply. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, to me, it's never been a thing. Like, when's the last time, Tom, you saw me just set my army up on a line? <laughs> that has literally never happened. Okay? No. No. <laughs> it's just, I see people do it in in battle reports or whatever, and I'm like, what are you doing? Why are your troops on that? Where's your chaff walls? Where's your second chaff wall? Where's your three-inch thing? So if somebody comes into you... It blows up your first chaff wall somehow, gets into the second one, and then piles through and attacks a second time, and they can pile six inches into your line. You're still protected. What are you doing with yourself? Like, uh, which is what 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 hurt my corn player when I talked about that double game was sure. that he set up on the line, and then went first, and I went, okay, everything's in shooting range. Yeah. I, so what's what's interesting about it to me is I always think of alpha strikes as being a fairly deploy counterable thing, right? Yeah, I agree. I agree. And 
I like I never alpha strike people. I would never do it because I think it's an absolute like super great way to lose a game. I think it's generally a stupid way to play to make an army that like unless somebody leaves the door open in such an obvious way that I can literally get in there and, and win the game on turn I, one for sure. Right. Like, you can't not you yeah. can't not shove your army down their throat. If yeah. they yeah, if they like if they do just if they have the dumbest deployment ever and I'm like, okay, well I guess I'll just win at the top of one. Fine. Yep. Right? Yep. But in general, I find turn one alpha strikes to be basically a way to auto lose. And so it has no appeal to me as a, as a strategy. I find it to generally be a losing strategy. And uh, the, the, the whole concept of it, it was fascinating to me that it rated so highly. Like, and, and what that tells me is I think that there's a, like a knowledge gap I was underappreciating. And I'm I'm just saying like I, I, I think there's I've a lot of people been, who don't think in terms of like well this is how I have to castle and chaff my lines and have units that push out and da 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 da. da. On average, I win my first three games in an event not because I'm good, but because I just know the game. Yeah, sure. Like like I know what things do and 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 how to set appropriate ranges and set up and like. You... Newsflash, folks! Like GI Joe was right. Yeah, sure. Knowledge is like, half the battle. Did yeah, I at know? least. I, yeah, knowledge is half the battle. Possibly even more. Sure. No, I agree. And so, it, 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 you know, what Matthew Varley just said in the chat: it takes experience to know how to deploy to prevent turn one alpha strikes. People who are playing maybe one or two times a year aren't doing that. Yeah, and I agree. That's what I'm saying. I think I was underappreciating that. So I think Matt's dead on there, right? I think that that kind of knowledge of critical deployment is an undervalued skill set because you can't look in a book and learn that. No, right? that's not a no. rule you can learn in a book. Yeah. Right. Okay. So what's fat? So at any rate, then I have the what makes NPE. This is a later question, but I brought it up here because overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly. The thing that won this, I did, again, this surprised me that this was this strong, right? Like, this won the election in a landslide, was the mechanic reduces interactivity in the game. With 68% yep. of the respondents answering that. Yes. As being the reason what that is ultimately... Everybody hates NPE. not getting to do anything. Right. And when you look at it through that lens it becomes much more clear. I did find the difference between activation wars which is the ability to fight first or make others fight last, right? Which, but by the way, that is reducing interactivity. 100%. Because what they're doing is they're taking away, again, I would even say it goes one step de deeper than interactivity. It's about changing expectations of how the game functions. Sure, sure. It's, it's reducing your interactivity in a way that just doesn't feel like how the game is supposed to play, right? Right. Yep. But it was fascinating to me, the the pretty big difference, right? Almost a, uh, 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 in fact, more than, I'm sorry, a 20 point difference between activation wars and multiple yep. fighting. Yep. Right? So if you fight twice, but in order, right? Where yep. you like, you have an ability to activate again, but it's in some kind of order. Right? Yep. Or... You fight during the hero phase or something in some kind of like way. fighting out of phase. Yeah, yeah. People seem to mind that much, much less. Like that ranked below high armor saves, high mortal wounds, and everything else we mentioned already. Yeah, is basically yeah. in the middle of the distribution. Right. So it's fascinating to me that like that space is okay, whereas the or it's more okay yeah the, yeah it's more okay you're right it's more okay more accepted should be the right way to say that right whereas the activation wars were so negative let's talk about the stuff at the bottom because i want i want this to lead into a discussion tom about about the nature of answering this question yeah so at the bottom of the chart we have high damage melee with almost nobody caring about it damage debuffs <laughs> almost nobody caring about it Objective control mechanics like like ogres and, and sons of behemoth, yep. basically nobody. High rend, that's a big winner. And bravery debuffs, okay, which was the absolute loser. I mean, bravery debuffs is so far at the bottom. People just don't care. Now, let's talk about what this means. Because this yeah. is interesting stuff to me. 
I also love, by the way, the instant kill effects. Did, did you rank so did low? You, and that we didn't have went, model restoration, did we? Uh, no, I did not do model restoration. Um, I, I, that was one thing that I missed. That I, I, I asked a bunch of people. Nobody gave me that one. And in my own list, I didn't think of it. It, it would have been a good one. Well, I mean, mechanically, it's not as prevalent as it used to be. Like before, when Legions of Nagash were there and they're putting the whole units back on the table, back when they're you're putting like three snakes back onto a unit of six every turn. Sure, sure. Like that's very different. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about the because this leads to a really interesting set of of concerns. Okay. Yeah. By the way, I yep. love that movement debuffs ranked so low. When to me, like that is one of the absolute killers of how to win a game. <laughs> right. Yeah. I guess we all just think that most people think that's well. Bad. How many? How many movement debuffs are there really in the game? A decent-ish number, but that's leading into exactly what I want to say. You're you're right. you're, you're hitting right on what I was going to get at. Yeah. Okay. There are multiple possibilities as to why things are low on this list. Okay. Yes. Possibility one: people truly don't care. Okay, like that is to say, they really don't consider it a negative play experience. Right. That's one. Yep. That's one possibility. Option two, frequency bias, right? It occurs so rarely that people just haven't experienced it enough to mind. Right. right. Or like it hasn't been, it hasn't popped up on their radar as something that's just like too too dominant. Like something can be good without being a winning strategy. Sure. Option three is it exists in any number but has no impact on your overall play experience because of other mitigating factors. Okay? Sure. And I'll, I'll, yep. the, I'll, two of these fall squarely into that category. Here's the first one. Damage debuffs. Like, there are things that debuff your damage. Not a lot of them, but there are some. But the fact that right. all of them cap at, you know, minus one damage or something Mid to a minimum yeah. of one, right? Means in general, like, who cares? Because most damage values in the game are one. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, that's you've got a neat trick there, but to most of the time, I don't care. Yeah? Yep. Bravery debuffs exist in the game, like, everywhere. <laughs> Just everywhere, right? Yeah, as uh, Ben Sava exploited uh, at a recent event. Sure. I mean, like, I think Dark Riders cause Neg 1 bravery. Like, really? <laughs> Whatever, you know? Just, like, everybody does this. You yep. know, but who cares, right? Because yep. Battle Shock is so mitigatable, right? That uh, you you just are like, yeah, whatever, right? Like, okay, yep. Um, so you've got like this. So you've got these three different things that can all get in each other's business, right? You can have a mix of those three. That's not independent. And I think though why why I say that's interesting is because here's my question, Tom. Should they be pushing more into this design space? Like we gotta give somebody special we gotta give people special abilities. Right? This can't just be rolling dice at each other. Well, I mean, so look look like let me just let's look at the sampling of what we have here. Mm -hmm. Um let's talk morale bravery debuffs. Okay. Inherently, bravery be debuffs do nothing. Yep, agreed. Inherently, like they functionally do nothing to the game. Yes, they only have an they only have an effect around the margins, right? Right. Yeah. So they only have an effect when you have to make a battle shock, mm -hmm. which is something that really doesn't happen if you don't want it to in this game. Mm -hmm. Like, if you have large units, you can save command points in order to sure. deal with the situation. Yep. Um, or you can include units that make you battle shock immune passively. Mm -hmm. Or the enemy is running things that trigger mortal wounds on 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 uh, against bravery check, which would be something like banshees or vargeis or you know like all of that stuff. Yep. The uh, death stuff that would trigger that. Yep. Um, or uh, yeah, and in general, that's just fairly rare. Lumineth are another exception to this because they can push this so extreme. Um, but, uh, it's just, it's not, I would say what it, it is not a winning tactic and definitely not against things like, uh, OCR. Yep. Sure. Who are just immune to battle shock as an army. Yeah. Right. 
And so, like, for me, when I read that one, it, that one is just not real. Um, like, it's not the thing. The thing isn't the problem. It's that thing when combined with other stuff. And so the experience of the negative isn't the problem. It's that when comboed out with other stuff. Sure. So let me ask you a question, Tom. High Armor is the number six overall. I know I hate yep. it. Right? Yep. And High Rend, nobody seems to mind. So is one of the fixes to the game just add Rend to a lot of armies where it should be? Like, up the average Rend by, let's call it one point across the board. It would speed up games. Yeah. Like, I think it was a really interesting set of sort of findings here. Because what ultimately... Uh, you, oh, go ahead. You know what you don't add it to? Okay. Shooting. Sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah. If shooting stayed... If shooting dropped a point of rend on average, right? And melee went up a point of rend on average, how much of the game's NPE do we solve right there? Weird. Right. Uh, so that's, it's just like, that occurred to me when I saw those two mirror each other like that, right? I was like, huh. Yep. A low and a high. Yeah. yeah. That's really interesting. Right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what I would say is that some of it is meaningful, like the objective based stuff. It's only, it's so infrequent that you see that. And then even then, like most of those giants aren't, or most of the ogres aren't snaking objectives from 30 man units. Mm-hmm. Right. Like they can edge shoot the you know the, the stuff guarded by five or ten models, but not you know. So like some of this, it just moves a lot of these uh, experiences into real corner case encounters, yeah. so that even if you encounter this army, it doesn't always dominate the exchange. Yeah, what I take from this chart plus the what makes NPE combination, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I agree with Rodney R, who says more rend would make dice rolls do more and more often. Yeah, I agree with that, right? Like, because it sucks when you roll a bunch of dice and then the people are like, well, I saved all of them. Like, okay. Yeah. Well, that was cool. Yep. Hmm. But what GW really needs to pay attention to in their design is they need to seriously ask the question, are we reducing the interactivity of the game by what we're doing here? Right, right. And shooting is always going to be a stickler, right? Right, because it is inherently a one-sided uh, uh, encounter. Right, and it has to be there. Which, right? by like, the way, I wonder if you moved towards uh, a kill team-esque shooting phase. An alternate shooting phase, you, you know, back and forth shooting? Yeah, if that would, if that would change the experience. Or is it just because some armies have it and some armies don't? Because yeah, like I, I think about because the reason why I bring this up is I think about something like um like the double turn. Sure. Imagine the shooting phase double turn. Like imagine how that would be mitigated if you get to shoot back during their shooting phases. Sure. I mean it would have so many cascading consequences into how you'd need to think about stuff and It would need stuff, a core yes. it needs a core rules redesign. Yeah. Like what I'm proposing is like Something for an addition change. It's not something for the world we're in. Yeah, but you still have the number two thing on the list, which is the mechanic is not evenly distributed, right? Uh, there, there's definitely right. a, a grass is greener syndrome here to some case, right. which is, which is by the way, not unfair. When right. you know we mentioned earlier that you've got armies like, uh, you know, you've got armies like ogres and people like that that just really don't have the bag of tricks, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, because they, you know, they don't get access to any of this special crap. <laughs> like when you look down this list or like, like shooting, nope, 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 maybe, nope, <laughs> you know, just on and on. Right. Nope, 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 nope. Just, you know, repeatedly they can, they're not getting this stuff. Right. And so same with sons, by the way. Yep. And uh, so there's definitely this inequity that's there at the same time, right? Um, so I, you know, I think that the, the most important thing we can harvest for this, from this is the following. Like here would be my summation of this data. One, the activation wars is pure poison. Yeah. Okay. Period. Two. Redesign bottom up. Yeah. 
two, and by the way, I think part of that is also like let's let's reimagine the activation wars if we can here, Tom. Okay, like let's get rid of the fight last portion of this and just think about fight first for a moment. Yep. Imagine if the most powerful unit that ever had strikes first, always strikes first or whatever, was the Slaves to Darkness Demon Prince. Sure. Okay. Imagine that was literally the best model with that ability. Sure. sure. Would this ability, would, would that have ranked so high? No, of course I, not. I don't think it would have even come close. You don't have, like, what you don't have is this. I charge your Hearth Guard unit and then get whatever I attacked with de deleted. And then they pile into something else and delete it. Right. 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 Yeah. When you've got Hearthguard Berserkers doing it, when you've got Ghoul Kings on Terror guys have, doing we it. We used to have we used to have them on. Like, and I'm describing about like being attacked when you charge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I get it. You're charging them, and then you die, and then they kill something else as well. Yeah. Right. Suddenly, we're playing like magic, and they have first strike. And you're like, when did this happen? They have double strike, as a matter of fact. Yes. Well, no, that the hearth guards have double strike. Yes. Right. Yes. Like, and but that's the problem is that like you don't ever get to reprisal. Um, right. I mean, how much how much would some of this have been solved by? And I know that this this may exacerbate the issue, but allowing you people to like activate first when they charge or something. Yeah. Like I, I know that I know that adds a bunch of like. It adds it to everybody. Sure. But it suddenly makes charging a whole lot more important. It does. Uh, I mean, you'd get a lot more tail in, right? People would tail yep. in other units a lot more. So yep. here's here's two quick thoughts, on, or three quick thoughts on this, I guess. Yep. One, the activation wars are pure poison, as I said. Fortunately, yep. that's been getting weeded out of the game, right? Yeah. It's, it's a yep. lot less prevalent now than it was in 2019. Right? Yep, it's being thinned out, certainly. Two, Magical Dominance is not far behind in how much people hate it, and they have hit that button a lot lately. Mm -hmm. Okay, so reverse course. <laughs> You're going the wrong direction on that. That's got to be, no. we, we got to back that out, right? Right. Three, th they need to think about interactivity deeply and how shooting actually should be working in this game. Who can shoot, how much you can shoot, what it the ability is like because the a very common response in the in the verbatims was stuff like I don't like having my character sniped, right? Which makes sense. You have these five wound heroes right. and they just get sniped out. But at the same time, the game has to have the ability to snipe out characters, like some kind of pressure valve on that, because otherwise, what you get is Death Star armies. Yep. You get Hearthguard Berserker clouds. You get Hearthguard Berserker clouds and Doc. Like, the preeminence of Doc was because no one could just snipe out their characters. Okay? Right. It was great. Yeah, I mean, that's what that is. If you can't and blow then, away a 5 and then Mad Queen it, on a 5 up and save... And then Skaven came along. What well, was sure. so fascinating, like, Skaven actually had a solution to some of that. And so, you know, like, we have to have some amount of shooting that actually can kill these characters. Like, these characters need to be able to die. I know it sucks sometimes. But look, you think Seraphon is bad now? Imagine Seraphon in the world where you can't kill those little skink priests. Okay? I want you to think about the nightmare that that is. Yeah. We're just at will every round. They're always making a unit mortal on sixes and do everything else they need to do and every other stupid buff they can add. Right. And there's no removing them. And there's no removing them. Right. Like, Seraphon would shoot to, like, 80% win rate over their current nonsense. Right? right. They'd get yeah, more broken. Yeah, is, is unremovable. Right. So, like, the, the problem is, is that it really, like, things that are bad, things that are the worst are, now that being said, it still shouldn't be so easy either, right? Like, the line here seems to be, I'm not saying it should just be easy to blow away characters, I'm saying it has to be doable, but there needs to be a better, like, costing to it, probably. Yeah? Risk-reward, investiture of amount of stuff it takes to get them off. Like, something like that. When you look at Croak or somebody like that just spamming big mortal wound bombs and incidentally blowing away characters, your mini-characters, right? Or OBR catapults just being like, 
Ha ha, boom boom. There you go, take that. I just killed two, you know, I, all of your five wound characters are dead in a round. Right. Right. Right? Yep. So, like, that's where it, and by the way, I agree that Seraphon is also, exploits this problem. That's what I'm talking about now, just to respond to Eric in the comments. I'm saying they would get even, like, they would get even worse if it got harder through targeted shooting to remove characters. What I'm saying is, the, we certainly shouldn't be killing these people through incidental area of effect splash garbage. They like can more, just wipe more, out yeah. all their characters, yep. right? That's the worst. And the idea that, like, you you should be able to kill them, but it should represent some investment. Like, instead of, you know, really hitting their unit that has 20, 30, 40 people in it, you invest about that amount of firepower into killing this character, right? And that, you get what I'm saying? There needs to be a better yep. balance in what you have to invest to pull it off, right? Yep. Um, and so the the other thing that occurs to me is... The armies that are clearly at the top of the meta are the armies that exploit multiples of these at the same time. <laughs> sure, sure. I think in a lot of the verbatims, what I saw is that people can stand one of these things. Mm -hmm. When units start doing multiple of these things simultaneously, right? When they fight first and fight twice and can alpha strike you, it's like, oh and, have after, and have after saves. Right. It's like, get out of here. And, and do high mortal wounds. Right. And, oh, oh, wait, where are we at? Right. We're, well, we're, we're on the ghoul king on terror. And, and, and have, and have minuses to terrorism. be wounded. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so I'm just, I'm just articulating my, uh, the center of my fire slayer army. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes. So like not they, they so not only do they have to think okay is the mechanic we're writing reducing interactivity they have to think okay we know these things are generally perceived as negative like these are powerful abilities we're handing out right <laughs> or we need to make sure we don't give multiple doses of this to right. one army group hero unit whatever right yeah. especially a yeah. power piece in its own right already that's when things get off the rail. It's not the rails. It's not that one of these things is happening individually and is poisoning the game. Because if that was the case, people would have said the mechanic in itself is always bad. Yep. Right? But instead, that was the lowest response. It's when these things start stacking. Because the cumulative, the, 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 it's, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. In that case. Right? Right? So, yep. th this one was really interesting. I mean, I know we spent a long time on the slide, but I think it behooves it. Um, yeah, totally. Because this was a real revelation to me. I think that I like. I I hope GW watches this, and I hope they look at this slide and really think deeply about all this stuff, right? right. Because when you read the verbatims, do you know how many of those verbatims broke my heart? Like there are some mm. that really, like, legitimately yeah. made me sad. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I read them, and they're like. And some of them, not all of them, but some of the verbatims, like, whatever, a few, it doesn't matter. Some number X. Yep. We're like, I played the game, this thing happened, and I just couldn't take it anymore, so I stepped away from the game. And I'm like, oh. Or, or I haven't played a game since. Yes. Yeah. That's like a dagger in my heart. I mean, I really mean that. Like, I felt so right. pained reading that. Right. Because I love this game. And I want it to be great. And hearing people say that, literally hurts me <laughs> okay yeah. and so i do hope that they think about these things seriously because yes you're affecting people at the margins but you're that's you're losing people for no reason right you didn't need to yeah. lose those people so there you go okay let's keep going Negative play experience by army. Let's dig into the by army cross tab. Here we go. Uh, okay, so this is this was a fun. <laughs> this is something I completely made up, but I'm happy about it. All right, Tom. This is my army NPE sentiment average. Here's what I mean by that. So this is a factor of the number of respondents who say they said they played that army normalized over their number of selections sure 
Do you understand what I mean? I do. So it's the relationship between the army itself and how many buttons they collect for MPE. Yes, exactly right. That's right. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So <laughs> So who... how complainy an army is. Yes. We we <laughs> I call this the butthurt scale. Yes, that's yes. right. This is the whiner scale. <laughs> Okay, so... They have awesome stuff, and they have awesome stuff, and they have awesome stuff. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so people at the left side of the chart, over here, clicked more buttons, right, on average. Yeah, they more they found more things within the scope of the list to be NPE. People on this side found less things on average. And remember, this is averaged over hundreds of people, right? So Which you is, get a pretty this, tight spread There's here. so much fascinating data here. There really is. Okay. <laughs> like, the most fascinating piece of data is the winner. What? Yeah, <laughs> Seraphon. What? Well, what are you complaining about? <laughs> when I count this out and saw that the most complaining army were the people who play Seraphon right uh, uh you know what that says to me your opinion doesn't matter anymore go sit in the corner i was like <laughs> what in all that is holy hold on i want to i want to address the comment real quick hey Chaz, i saw your comment there about uh i i i have to tell you i don't play but from what i've seen with balance i probably uh would not for a game that costs as much i would expect a lot of balancing so here's what i'll say this is a deep dive into a fairly negative sentiment right because we're talking about the the bad parts of the game Overall, and this is chess. one experience over two years. Right. Remember, this is one experience. Yeah, exactly. That's the, the the level here. Most games I have of this, uh, most games I play of this game, and I play every week, are so fun and so perfect. And, like, legitimately, I there's nothing else I do in a week other than my D&D &D game that I look forward to more. So please don't take this all as being blown up as more than it is. This is an exploration of how we take a good, even maybe a great game, and make it even better. That's all it is. Uh, I would, if you find a good group of good people, you're going to have nothing but fun when you sit down at the table, I promise. So I just, I wanted to address that. I, I mentioned it earlier, but it's, it's worth, it bears repeating, right? Because it's easy when we dig into this to, to get swept up in the negative and feel like we're stuck on that. Yep. No. Okay. That's fair. So the, the, the only thing I could think of with the Seraphon players is that they're literally self-answering. All right. Sure. You know what I mean? They're like, they're, they're like. Well, people hate when we do this. Right. And this. We're broken. We pick all the things we're broken with. Like, are they answering the question them for, for in light of their own army? Right? Yeah. The next ones are all exactly what I expected. Like, Sylvaneth, Ogres, Heed Knights. Yeah, sure. Again. Yep. Exactly what I expected. Um, the other end of the list is our cool guy end of the list right and there was a clear winner here by the by clear yeah. winner osiarch bone reapers players apparently obr they got a couple things that are bothering them but for the most part they're fine they're yeah, like I mean, almost a I, full I, point better than they're, they're sad that they don't get to activate first but whatever they can most of the time weather it right <laughs> they're the most chill yes uh, so, like, this one was interesting because this was sort of, like, um, this was just a, a calculation that was an interesting emergence from the data, right, as I normalized this out, that I no. thought was fun. I don't know that I have many conclusions to draw from this. I just thought it was Oh, no, it's just fascinating. Yeah, by the way, the number of these charts, yeah, by the way, this isn't every army. I, I ran these for some, not all of them. Yeah, Fire Slayer doesn't show up on a bunch of these. Yeah, like, like it if they were really low data... Some of them I didn't run because I didn't feel like we'd be at statistical significance. You know, some right. of them I didn't put like, everyone it's in here. skew the ends. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Uh, at any rate, so yeah, I mean, not every one of these has every single army run for it because I had to, like, manually do a bunch of stuff to calc every one of these out. So, like, I left Lumineth and Sons and Fire Slayers off of a lot of these because they were so low on their responses and on their newness. I'm not sure it felt good to answer. At any rate... Mm -hmm. The number of lists that Skaven end up in the middle of yeah. are really funny. They're just like, Skaven, when they initially came out, they were busted, but it was purely because of points, right? It wasn't yeah. actually because of what they did or how they played for the most part. Their yep. points got adjusted, and now they're just like, they are Captain Middle of the Road. 
Well, they're right there. You know, I think a big piece of that is though. I think that, that there's a. I think there's an explanation for the part of that at least. Um, I really think a big piece of that has to do with the fact that like Skaven is such a big army. There's so many permutations of what that army is. Sure. Yep. That like, there's, there like. Playing a pestilence army is not the same as playing a like a mixed arms hard as nails skaven list. Sure, taking a flesh meld menagerie and going nuts, or taking a big warp cog convocation, or whatever. Right? Yeah, like it's it is an army that has a million faces, which is great. Right. Much right. like the horned rat himself. Okay. Indeed. Cool. Uh, let's keep digging into this. Uh, so here we get into the individual NPE factors by type army. So again, we're down in the cross tabs here. Uh, this is an interesting, so, so this whole section, here's what we're doing, because we're going to have lots yep. of these. What we're doing is I'm taking a single type of NPE, right? Yep. And we're saying the people who played that army, right? What was their overall selection of it, right? Like how much yep. were they selecting? How did people, how did any one specific army, uh, react to certain types of MPE. Right, exactly. Yep. So this one's fascinating because my my the reason I wanted to dig into the cross tabs on this was because I wanted to see if people were were honest with themselves. <laughs> okay, I don't sure. know how else to say it. Sure. Like if you are playing an army that wins by exploiting a particular type of NPE. Right. Do you less frequently select that thing. Okay. Yep. And the answer is yes, sort of. Right. right. You have to be like really exploiting it for it to the most, for the most part to have, for it to have an effect. And even then it's not as strong as I was expecting. Okay. So when I look at this, yeah, go I want to be like, what KO are complaining about the activation wars? What's wrong in your life that you're complaining about the activation wars in KO? Well, the answer is quite a lot, actually. <laughs> Apparently. Right, which is hilarious to me because what are you doing with your life? You're not killing anything in melee anyways. Stop it. A lot of people play in Endron Riggers, I guess. They're not. They're not. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, man. That's not what the data says. Sure. We have data on those things. Sure. So the people who hate the activation wars the least, yeah, yep, are obviously the armies that benefit from it the most, which is which Weird. tracks. Heed Knights Weird. being way lower than everybody else, like an obvious standout, followed very closely behind by Flesh Eater Courts. Again, well, that's just like, no, they're fine. Yeah, <laughs> but even then, how? Like, it's funny to me how many Slanesh players were either thinking of their own army and being like, yeah, that's bad. Right. right? Yep. Like they exploit it and don't like it. That's the only like that. Cause that's part of the reason why the number could be pushed up so high. Right. They could be answering it and going, yes, I know it's bad. I do it, but I don't like it either. You know, right. so they could have sort of an addict syndrome. Right. Yep. Uh, and you know, and then flesh eaters and IDK, uh, Oryx was a fascinating one to me because, mm -hmm. you know, the War Clans don't really exploit the Activation Wars per se. I guess we could count Smashing and Bashing, probably. Yeah, right? but, you know, I don't consider that like Activation Wars in the same way because it's not reliable. Like, one of the big things in competitive play is reliability. When Smashing and Bashing happens, like, it, you, it, it can sometimes be planned for, um, but sometimes it's a throw of the dice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's very different than my, I spend a command point and I always strike first. Sure. Over on the right side of the chart, we find the armies that hate the activation wars the most, uh, which is Stormcast, Cities, and Bone Reapers, with Bone Reapers standing out a pretty significant chunk above everybody else. Uh, like, again, because all these are very normalized, like even a half percent like jump is meaningful. Why do they keep hitting us first? Yeah, I guess. I, I was like, all right. I This is like the OBR players were pretty chill. Remember, right, on the last slide, the OBR players were like the chillest group. Do we get one F-bomb? The but, OBR, they're, they're, they're no, fine. Please, they're like, please not. 
But yes, they were like, yes, they were, you just say it this way, they were like, F this thing in particular. Right? <laughs> yes. Right, everything's cool. Activation Wars, you're out. This one thing. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, so it was it was funny to me that, that that that's how that spread out. Things like the daughters hating it was, I suppose, interesting. Um, because they don't get it. Yeah, I, I guess is that just envy? Like, is that just it's not evenly distributed? I mean, they have multiple fighting; they just don't have activation wars fighting, right? So, yeah, right. right. So when people go into their witches, like if they get forced last by Slanesh, they don't have a reprisal; they right. just go last. Sure. Yeah, the the but this chart mostly spread out how I expected it to, right? right? Like Stormcast being up top, not surprising at all to me, right? So on and so forth. It actually surprised me that ogres were so middle of the the road on this one. Um, there's a lot of them where they're not. <laughs> this right. one, they're kind of dead center, uh, right. which was surprising. Uh, that's not that's not actually common amongst this list, uh, mm -mm. as we as we get into them. Uh, so yeah okay cool so the activation wars percentage wise you'll notice they're going to be higher than a lot of the other percentages we look at because again they were the it was the most frequently selected thing right yep uh all right next one high armor saves this one i love tom i love high armor saves so much I, because you know this one i have a uh, like i have an absolute here's what's so funny about this chart tom you know that high armor saves are quite literally one of the two things I hate most in the game. Right. And right. if you look at the right of the chart, you'll see all of Vince's armies. <laughs> yep. <laughs> there they are. Just like the two highest, these towers over the rest of the chart are well, my three. two. Yeah, three. Exactly. The third one is, it's, it's, it, there's Daughters. three of your armies yes. are all, all grouping to the right. Yep. Yep. Uh, which let me just other than Gloom Spike gets, you have all of the top seven armies. <laughs> it's true. Like, let me point that out. Yeah. yeah. Skaven, Seraphon, uh -huh. Beasts, yep. Daughters, Hedonite, yep. War Clans. Yep. Uh, and even Ogres, sorry, eight. Yep. <laughs> Seems sure. to map. So it like I I was glad to see that whatever the psychographic profile is that I have that there are others like me right that that I that that yes there's some reasoning at the subconscious level behind my hatred and that others are in this milieu with me right uh, so I enjoyed that I thought that was very funny yep. uh, when I saw this particular chart I was like oh well there you go okay. Yeah. And I, I see Stormcast, and they're like, uh, we'll use our Star Soul Maces. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, Stormcast are just like, no, no, this is our thing. Shut up. Get away. Don't you touch it. Don't you touch our only thing. <laughs> <laughs> we have a thing we do. Leave us alone. Yeah, absolutely. You know, again, the left side of this chart, very predictable. Stormcast, Ossiarch. Uh, Sylvaneth doesn't surprise me, probably mainly on the back of things like Kernoth, right, yeah. or something like that. Or a lot of people, or, or their heroes, we can get to, to low saves. Um, not to mention the fact Kurnoth in both directions, right? That Kurnoth can often be rather tough, uh, and also the fact that they have a pretty decent access to like Neg Two Rend and stuff like that. Yep. So I'll call it decent. I don't want the Slave, slaves. Slaves have the Nurgle buff. Yep, they can. Uh, they can Nurgle buff. Yeah, Archeon. they can Nurgle buff. Yeah, exactly. Cities again. Similarly, you can you can often end up with some crazy armor saves in cities with stuff like Tempest Eye and things like that. You know, this is my uh, forty block of dwarven. Iron Breakers or whatever that are on a two up save, you know, that I can make reroll ones in round one. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, very clear standouts here in the Heed Knights and Oryx, both of whom are almost completely melee only armies, right? Like, that's it. They have no other tricks. There's like right. Right. two shooting attacks in those armies combined, right? Yep. And they almost across the board have Neg One Rend. Yeah, yep. Like, there's very little Rend zero. Super defense, yeah. In 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 that army, but everything is just Rend one. Yep. Right. Yep. So it, it just like anytime armor drifts above four plus, they just aren't going to crack the egg, right? Right. Okay. Uh. 
Magical Dominance. So, um, this is a funny chart. Because, Tom, I would not have guessed in a million years who Magical Dominance bothered the least. Really? Yeah. The least? Yeah. Like, I, daughters aren't playing in the Spell Dom game. Right. Right? That's the point. They're like, like, they're like, wait, let me get this right. You cast spells really well and you shut other casters down? Cool. I'll take my five up re-rollable. Let's do this. Yeah, I, I guess... And, and I'll stab sure. you in the throat. <laughs> like... I guess it's because they have prayers and they don't really need their only one spell that they actually care right. about for the most part. Right. right. So wait, let me get this straight. All of my magic still works. I have a resistance against all of your magic and I stab people in the throat really well. Sure. Got it. Sure. I just wouldn't have guessed them to be literally the lowest, right? I would have assumed that that side of the board was going to be like Seraphon, Disciples. Well, you know, know what this does? Stuff. You know what they say when they see in the spell dom meta? They're like, "Cool, I get 140 more points." Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, because I'll just like I'm not going to dedicate a wizard to this anymore. I'm going to give it to Marathi, and I'm going to spend that dedicated spot on other units. Yeah, yep. Because they still have a good enough caster in Marathi to get the job done, um, and then it just becomes icing. It never be it, like it's, you don't require the the murder the murder buff. Yeah. On the opposite side of the chart, it's very funny to me because it's a mix of armies that like really want their spells to to do stuff, right? Yep, like yep, they yep. have decent spells that they need to 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 get off to actually make the army kind of function, and that don't generally have any more than like a couple buffs here or there to cast, right? Or ogres and gets and yeah, like, uh, where they just they, gets they and can't get there. Yeah, here's what's funny about that. The top three armies all have some kind of access to plus one to cast. Pretty pretty natively. Right? And really good spell like good spells that yes. do real work. Right. And they're like in Skaven's case, who were way out above everybody else here, right? right? Um you have the reality that they you're paying for everything you have to be a double caster. Right. Right. So, like, you can gen up a lot of spells. And, again, all three of these, you're generally going to, you know, you can often operate with plus one uh, because of the moon for the gits, because of the cauldron for the ogres, and because of the gnaw hole for the, um, uh, for the skaven, right? So all yep. of them have, like, some kind of relatively decent access to plus one. Yep. And, you know, skaven can also obviously eat their magic rocks or whatever. Like, there are ways to, to push around their casting. But none of their casting still equals what the spell doms can do, right? Right. They're not table wide. They're not automatic. They're not plus four or whatever. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. And so it was just interesting to me that those three armies are all like, they have some kind of magical ability, not high. Yep. They all really want their spells and they all really get punished by being in a meta where they can't use those spells. Right. right. Again, I love the Karadran overlords were like, man, I hate this. I hate this uh, thing. And I'm just like, come on, guys. Shoot Get the back. wizards? I don't know. Shoot um, no, I, I mean, mean, it's four wounds. It's being able to pick off uh, yeah, strategic sure. targets. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and you, that endless spell that you're going to drop, your warp fire, your warp, your, your low warp lightning vortex is going to only last one round. Like against the spell dom, Teclas is going to be like, nope. Pew. Right or or uh, the Lord of Change is going to shoot it down automatically. Um, yeah, I yeah absolutely. I agree. By the way, with uh, with Joe uh, McGill who said in the comments, I am kind of surprised Blades was as high as they were. I was too. I guess because uh, pulse, that, like if they were more anti magic, they would be great. But the problem is, is you want to spend spell tie or you want to spend blood tithe. On more bloodthirsters. You don't want to spend spell tithe on d dispelling spells. Yeah, exactly. And when you look at it, it's like, okay, well, sure, they have a lot of people who can dispel, but what is that worth in a spell dom? How, how different would that army be if, like, they just had a generic allegiance ability, which is like, corn hates magic. You get to throw unbinds at every spell. Sure, 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 sure. And I'll say they don't often have a ton of bonuses to their unbinds. Like sometimes that you can get like that plus two. Right. 
And yep. it, even even their best trick, which is their skulls, like the little hex forger skulls. Yep. Techless is just like, oh, that's adorable. Look at that little cute. Look at those little cute things. I cast on tens unmodifiable. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> right. 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 So yeah, I just, like I man, that army would be so much better. It's like so benefited by just giving them like a free unbind, like corn unbinds the spells mm -hmm. on you know just an unmodified you know throw at the dice. Yeah, um, it would it would do a lot for that army that is basically all melee anyways. Sure. So this one was interesting. Let's go to the next one. Uh, multiple fighting. Uh, who, uh, yeah, I, I, by the way, I agree with assistant rep who said, uh, or sorry, with, with Brenwood who said Zinch and slaves are back to back here, but not as low as I thought. Uh, night haunt just got sort of left out of this. That's, that's actually an error on my part. I'm sorry. I didn't bring the night haunt in. I should have, I thought I got all the big ones, but I realized I didn't. Again, I had to put all this together manually out of a lot of pivot tables and stuff. So I accidentally left off the ghosty boys. That was unintentional. Uh Fire Slayers didn't make it either, but they're a low but, sample. But they were an intentional cut. Yeah, all the, the low and new cut, those were intentional. I thought I got all the ones that weren't that. I just accidentally left the ghosts out of some of these, so I'm sorry. Like I said, I'll, I'll publish out the data so people can take a look on their own if they want. Um, Okay, multiple fighting. Uh, I love that Blades is way over on the left, and they're just Blades, Daughters, Heed Knights, Flesh Eaters, exactly the four that you would expect to be down there, right? The, just, they're like, I don't see anything wrong with this. Yeah, the four armies who are like, nah, we're good with this. This is exactly where we're living, brother. This is what we do. Uh, so that that did not surprise Storm me. Cast, making a surprising appearance down there. Until you realize they're like, oh, wait, high armor's our thing. Yeah, go ahead, and you can attack twice. Right, exactly. I'm fine. Like, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. Go ahead, roll your dice, waste your time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then over on the right side of the chart with uh, the people most bothered, Magakin, Eidneth, and Maw Tribes. <laughs> sure. Maw Tribes does <laughs> not surprise me. They're way out on top. And again, this is where they. I know that like there's a big pain point for them. Yep. Bl Blight Kings were like, you get to do what? Yeah, sure. I was surprised to see Ideneth up here. That the, the, they were like, obviously, I know they don't have any multiple fighting. They're right. they're activation wars people, not multiple fighting. And yeah. I just was very surprised that this bothered Ideneth players that much. I right. guess they don't right. like dying in the hero phase, but I, I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Well, they just want always strikes first. Well, I don't know. That yeah, that's that's activation wars. That's not even this. I, I don't know. Yeah, I this is what I'm saying. It's a complete mystery to me. Yeah. They're they're the outlier that I cannot explain why IDK players are this bothered by multiple fighting. Well, they don't get it. Uh, yeah, I mean, sure, but like they have a lot as we mentioned, other than this, they are the grab bag of NPE tricks. Right. Well, what I'll say is this. I would suspect that IDK, one of the challenges that they have is like fighting eels, then reprise zap, and then them getting jammed by another unit that piles in that was out of range. Sure. Or something like that. Hero phase or something. Yeah. Like that. Yeah, exactly. So they lose a bunch of their strategic units in a phase that they can't do anything about. Right. So yeah. just. Oh, no, could be. They also tend to have sort of a lower wound count, so losing things off phase where they have less ability to respond yep. could also be quite costly. Um, so yep. maybe that's why. Don't know. Again, I can I can like guess, but it's hard to get a read on that one. Some of these you look at and you're like, "Yep, makes total sense. Completely understand. No question about it." Sometimes you get those outliers that are interesting. Shooting armies. We have a lot of slides to go, buddy. Oh yeah, there's so many. Did somebody ask about the number of slides? No, but I was like, man, we're uh, we're solid, you know, two and a half hours in. Where were we? Oh, man, we got a lot of slides. <laughs> Dude, there's a lot of data. <laughs> there's a lot of data. Okay, okay. so NPE factors by type uh, or army, by type and army. So, yeah, so shooting armies. Again, look at, hmm, who's K the outlier in this thing? Like, okay, I was like, I don't see anything here. Yeah, no problems here, folks. Everything's fine. <laughs> move Everything, along. Move along. How are you? No, it's all good. <laughs> this is these are not the mechanics you're looking for. Yeah, I just I love how the <laughs> drop off on them. At least what we can say is the KO players are honest, right? Yeah. Like, 
Yeah, at least they're they like, know what they're doing. They're like, we in other phases, but we get shooting, leave us alone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, like, the one that surprises me by the by down here at the bottom, so when I look at it's these, I'm like, chaos. it is. I was like, sure, Chaos, Gaven, Sylvaneth, okay, like, all these armies yep. use shooting to their advantage in some kind of cities way. Yeah, cities, exactly. Yeah. I guess I guess Orc War Clans just don't care because you don't have enough time to shoot me until you're dead. Like I'm gonna get to you first, so whatever. I'm gonna I'm gonna charge across the battlefield. I'm gonna hand and then charge. Yeah. Not, you know, nothing's touching me. But the but... beast players being so okay with shooting an army that relies on five wound jank heroes that can just die from a stiff breeze. It's fine. I like we. we... We have clouds. I you know, I don't know. I don't. Um. I don't know why. I mean, they have some shooting, and don't they have Ungor Raiders? Yeah, sure. That... You guys have like Ungor Raiders, but I mean, that's okay. That's not. It's not really powerhouse shooting. Uh, Cygors throw rocks. You got me on that one. <laughs> um. Yeah, I I'm surprised that Magikin's not lower. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty middle of the road, all things considered, right? I guess it's because, yeah. you know, in the end, there's a lot of after saves in Magikin. There's a lot of negatives to to be hit in shooting yeah. across that army. I'm, sure, but, like, I'm surprised, like, even IDK, who's going to ignore it through line of sight blocking stuff, um, they're pretty middle of the road. Yeah, I was actually quite surprised that they weren't lower, that they were even, right. they were even as high as they were. Being that right. they have pretty much the best anti-shooting tech in the game right 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 i love how seraphon's like we need to do something about this shooting it's a problem <laughs> to our dominance <laughs> the only thing that can actually minorly threaten us is long range shooting and the ability to Ign snipe out some of our or stuff. short medium range shooting yeah, ignore these fine. salamanders over here yes obviously we're that's fine with short shoot. range those shooting. are clearly fine that's yes. how we're talking about. <laughs> yes. I, I love, yeah, I do love that they were like, this is, this is bad. Like, okay, guys. Okay. We got it. Yep. Uh, and then FEC, Daughters, OCR, and Heed Knights all being at the top. Uh, yep. Everybody that's going to lose strategic pieces. Yep. Everybody that's going to lose strategic pieces that is very weak to shooting. Um, obviously, Bone Reapers can exploit some shooting sometimes in their catapult heavy armies, but, you know. I mean, when you look at that, it's like, those are all, especially in the case of, like, Heat Knights and Flesh Eaters, you're talking about low-wound armies that have their main pieces being very susceptible to shooting. Right? Yep. So it's yep. just an obvious, immediate, like, their entire game plan collapses under under a against a shooting army, just like that. So. New plan. Yeah. All right. Turn one Alpha Strikes. Uh, look who's the lowest, Tom. Look who's totally okay with turn one alpha strikes. That's fine. We have, you know why? Because they have enough chaff lines. Correct. Because under why? no condition do they care about this. Either they can do it because they're actually really fast. And even their foot dudes can often turn one alpha strike people by running like they're a like, million we're, miles we're across cool. the board. We're good. Or they have just, their whole army is chaff. They have an, <laughs> like, that's literally, I just brought chaff. You're but, shooting Ungor? Okay, go yeah. ahead. Exactly. Enjoy. Uh, and then Oryx, again, doesn't surprise me, an army that loves doing turn one alpha strikes, right? Sylvaneth, who very much has turn one alpha strike capability and can often castle against it quite easily, right? right. Uh, Ogres I was an interesting one to me. I assume just because they generally have the meat to take it and or are sometimes capable of it, depending on the build well, and the, on the yeah, particular battle yeah. plan. Uh, so it turns out the, the, the top bar though, Skaven, Skaven as, as hating the turn one alpha strike the most. Tom, how do you read that? Uh, that they feel that they, that their battle plans are very susceptible to being removed. Like, so like when I look at that, I think about like, they're really concerned about losing their acolytes. Mm -hmm. They're really concerned about losing their X. Their like certain pieces are really susceptible to getting like 
they're going to lose all their clan rats because they're going to have their battle shock immune stuff removed at the top one. I don't know. I don't know why they're so whiny. Maybe because it's an army that doesn't have a lot of easy access to battalions. And so, like, I mean, you have to often, like, buy a command point. I mean, they do have a lot of Battleshock immunity, so... They have all the Battleshock immunity. Yeah, Stop it's... Stop whining. <laughs> like, like, it's... Like, I'm gonna say the same thing to KO, okay? Here, newsflash, KO, you don't get to whine about first turn Alpha Strikes. Because you're, yes, the, you're the home of turn one Alpha Strikes? You're the home of it. Now, yeah. granted, they are super susceptible to it. Like, sure. when I'm facing another turn one alpha striker, like, you, you got to understand that I'm doing, like, seventh dimensional math over here to make sure nothing gets in and, and my stuff can't get removed at the top of one. Sure. Okay. Because, and and granted, KO don't have the, 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 the like, the one drop alphas. Mm -hmm. They're almost always two and three drop, meaning against a one drop armies, they're actually really susceptible. Against like super high mobility one sure, drops, sure, like eels. But there's no good eel IDK armies. But you get the idea. I do. Yeah, I mean KO makes sense to me. You're right because even though they're the home of one drop alpha strikes, or, or, or well, yeah, I mean low drop alpha strikes. That's a better way to say it. At the same time, they can be very susceptible to it. Like if somebody out drops them and can you know go and do a lot of damage. If you can get in on that boat yeah, and exactly. do the damage, the game ends. Yep. Yep. Exactly, the daughters because they can lose a lot of characters. Like if they're if they're hag queens and slaughter queens get blown off the table, right? Then their army. Uh, it's called Marathi, but continue. Sure. Uh, Disciples is the one that made the most sense to me out of that top list yeah. besides Ko. Yeah. Zinch generally is extremely low drop, right? Yeah. But if they get alpha struck hard, they just they will fold. Right, they, they just yeah. don't have the wounds to generally withstand it. Even even with like, unless they're a super heavy pink spam build, nonsense. Yep. Right? right. Um, I was surprised to see again. I was surprised to see IDK kind of in the middle of the list. I thought they would have been yeah. a little lower, because again, they do alpha strikes really well if they want to, yep. and they're very protected against it. I mean, their whole army's in cover yeah. automatically. They and now they can have their void drum up as well. I mean. Uh, a big portion of their army is going to be on like three ups or two ups in the first round, you know? Yeah. And they're, again, they can prevent shooting alpha strikes by being like, well, no, you can basically only shoot that dude. You can only shoot my unrendable turtle or whatever. Yep. So, anyway. Yeah. Okay. Enough of that. Uh, let's get into the summary of this particular section. Um,. My thoughts, and Tom, I welcome your own. So, but here, here are my summary thoughts. Like players seem to be responsive to their own army strengths. If you're benefiting from a thing, you're less likely to view it as NPE, right? Yeah, uh, like that seems to map pretty consistently. Yep. Um, the activation wars were the highest overall amongst everybody. In, you know, it was the highest chip pick amongst all the armies and stuff like that. Although, again, we're going to get to a really interesting thing in just a moment. Shooting continues to be a challenge. We talked about that already. Um, you know, armies shouldn't have really heavy, especially long-range shooting. Um, like, uh, we've mentioned the skill floor already, and my personal bias of high defense is rolling lots of dice for little effect did not rate nearly as high as I expected. Nope. What else did you see from any of that, Tom? What other What other sort of from the fact? Uh, the penalties to hit really struck me. Yeah. Like, everybody's always complaining about penalties to hit, mm -hmm. but nobody actually ranked it as, like, soul-crushing. So, like, as a negative play experience, uh, I think there's a lot of interesting data when you get into the factors. There's definitely a grass is always greener syndrome going on, right? And, you know, it still raises the, like, it's good to see that people do respond to these kinds of quote-unquote incentives, I guess, is what we would yep. call it. But when you see something like shooting where the couple armies that benefit from it are really low and then it just, like, jumps up and a lot of people really hate it, that says something. Right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Ranking. Let's get into them ranks. All right. So this was a really complicated set of data to work with. Okay. Because, so the way this worked in the, in the survey, 
is in the previous question, you selected, you multi-selected the items that you thought were NPE. Yeah. In the next question, you then ranked the ones that you thought were NPE in order of, you know, right. worst. Severity. In order of severity. Yeah. Yep. So yep. what's the number one worst thing? Here's yep. what's fascinating, Tom. This incredible deviation happened. And I this is so telling. We remember okay. that Activation Wars dominated yes. on the overall number of selections. Right? Yep. yep. But when we then had people rank, 104 respondents ranked shooting as number one. Yep. 51 percent of the people who selected shooting and by the way these the way you need to read these percentages is horizontally right it's saying of all people yep. who selected shooting 51 percent ranked it as number one that's that's how that right. percentage is working right, right. It's, it's a horizontal percentage the, so that you can read the count vertically and the percentage horizontally just so we're all clear. yep so what this says to me is that yes people hate the activation wars but holy heck do they hate shooting <laughs> right like look at the intensity yeah of that selection like, it of all of places. the things that they could choose shooting right up at the top remember it was number three yep in the number of selections right but by yep. raw count of rank at number one it jumped up to the top yep right 50% of, of people who included it, think about this, 50% of those that included it in their list put it at first. Yes, That's said it's it. the worst thing. Yes. So if you put it as one of the problems in this game, hear, hear this audience, if you said that shooting was bad, there was a 50% chance you said it was the worst thing. Yes. Yes. Isn't That's that crazy? Isn't that crazy? Yeah, exactly. As, as Matthew said, 75% had it in the top two. Right. Right. Again, it's just complete. It, it completely inverted my expectations there. Because when I saw it as number three, I was like, yeah, well, that's not surprising. I know people hate shooting. And then I got to this data set and I was like, whoa, that is a big old swisheroo. Well, right? and talk about edging out that the top. Whoa. Like, you want to know what the problems of the game are. Look at the top four. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, uh, and then the uh, the fact that, uh, so let's talk about magical dominance. Because there's another, if we move over to number two, yep. to rank yep. two, then magical dominance becomes really interesting. Magical dominance beats both of the, it, it's the highest number two, right? Right, right. Uh, so, uh, again, in within its chart, right, right. Almost, basically almost 40% of the people who selected it said that it was the second worst thing. And so Magical Dominance uh, was the by far most popular number two choice. So a yeah. lot of people, again, it was number two overall in the survey. It was number two very hard with a, with a bullet here, right? Yep. Uh, so I found this, I found that to be really interesting again, because we've been going down this road so strongly recently, mm -hmm. it tells me stop, <laughs> stop it. Yep. Yeah. What we're doing is a problem. I love how we like, as soon as, uh, techless dropped nine months ago, that's when the spell bomb got coined. Right. Right. Yes, that's correct. And I remember immediately we were like, this is bad. This trajectory, if this continues, is going to be bad for the game. Guess what? Data bears it out. Yeah. It's interesting because Activation Wars, though it was the most popular choice by raw total count, right? Yep. It's much yep. more distributed amongst the top three as to how people found it, right? Right. Whereas right. shooting, just everybody, it just front-loaded all on number one. Like, people freaking hate it right now. And right. I wonder if that's not a function of the fact that, as we mentioned, the activation wars has been kind of, you know, falling into the background. Right. And right. and and shooting is at the forefront. 
You look at those top armies. Yeah. Yep. Ko, Seraphon, Siege. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, yep. Just exploding Doc. shooting one after the other. Doc. Doc. Oh, Newsflash, sure. snake shooting. Yeah, snake shooting. Like, spamming yep. snake shooting. Doc's up at the top right now, too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. It's funny. It's I so... This this gets into the anchor bias, right, Tom? Yeah. It's so funny because I said I said Doc, and you're like, "What do you mean, Doc?" Yeah, I, I, it just didn't click in my brain for a minute. Right, but you're right. absolutely right. Um, it's it's this sequestered thing that is. By the way, LRL also with Sentinel. Oh yeah, LRL. Yep, yep. Um, you know, it's it's sequestered into a few armies can do it really really well, right? With either high rend shooting, high rend. Uh, mortal wound shooting, or sorry, uh, long range, high range shooting, or long range mortal wound shooting, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. When those things all start getting together, then it gets really bad really fast. And I think when you look at those top armies, they're all doing some combination of that crap, right? If everybody in the army had an eight inch shot, and that was it, yeah. if that was the extent of the range, it'd be like, okay, yeah. whatever, who cares? Right. Yeah, I I can just see that monkey, that Muppet meme or whatever, where they're like looking at the camera side eye. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yes. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, well, yeah. So, uh, he's, you know, LRL is not statistically a top. I'd argue. I. But it gets a horrible experience, and that's the point. Yeah, I mean, the evidence we have is that they're, they, from TTS, is that they're a pretty top-ranking army, um, that they're in the top five or six armies. So, I mean, again. Right. And most of those are like 60 archers. Well, it, it varies a lot. Sometimes you got 30, sometimes yeah. you got, sometimes you got skew lists, but sure. Yep. I mean, again, I, you know, I was on Rob's show last week, and he, we did the stonks section. And so it's, you know, what are you selling? What are you buying? Right. In light of the recent goings on in the world. Yeah. And I said, if I'm a buyer, I'm a buyer for LRL. You're talking about an army that's already a tier easily. A tier. And it's getting a new book. And it's getting a new book and adding like 13 units, 12 units, something like that, you know, whatever to that yeah. with yeah. new synergies, new nonsense. Like I, I do not know how that army doesn't just immediately explode into S tier. So we'll see. Anyways, right. you're getting a point rebalancing. <laughs> I guess. Uh, no, don't feel bad for playing them. Never feel bad for playing an army. It's not the, you should never feel bad for playing says, an army. Says ever. the Slanesh player, I, which I willingly shelved. Right. But that was, <laughs> yeah. and I didn't like, because it was unfun for me to play with my friends. That's, yeah. that's a choice yeah. that I made. You should not feel bad for playing an army. That army should be better balanced and taken into, and, and be brought into line, so you don't have to feel bad for it. People love love the army you love, play the armies you want to play, right? Okay. It's not on you. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> assistant ref says, LRL point rebalancing. Sentinel's down 20 points. There you go. They and, them and Croak, both down 20. Okay. So... Uh, Let's look at the bottom of this chart. So this is this is the other half of this chart, right? Um, high amounts of dice rolling, damage debuffs, high melee damage, bravery, and high rend. Like you just look at the counts here, right? Very very low points. This is where the data drops like a rock. This whole set of things is where they just stopped showing up as anybody picking them as number one. Right. We're literally just talking about a handful of people in almost every case. And, you know, we already talked about this, right? Like, is this does this mean it's safe to explore this more and push it into the meta and new design? Or does it mean that as we do that, they would push way up? Right. Like, imagine if AOS 3.0, as you've talked about, Tom, gets rid of the become immune to battle shock. Right. Command right. Ability. Does that like let's just imagine that's gone. OK. Yep. Do bravery debuffs then all of a sudden matter? I mean, for I some armies. But then, uh, and then KO's like, peace. Because they have a bunch of passive bubbles. Yeah, sure. I mean, like, oh, that's just it. If they do that, then 
does that create does that create the shooting situation right of the haves and the have nots because some right. armies are just like yeah battle shock ha, ha, her her i don't need that command ability i haven't used that in years you know right. Rune reapers right. skaven whatever right Doc. yeah sure whereas awesome. a lot of we don't know what had is going to do in the new new book but sure sure yep uh so you know the um the the point is is that like that three factor thought of like it's it's voted low because it's just okay and you can explore it more it's voted low because the frequency of it is so rare right now people can't properly evaluate it right to so get a frequency bias or you people vote it so low um because other game mechanics are mitigating the negativity and it makes it really difficult to know what you can rightfully explore here. Yeah. What I'll say is that if I were to take a guess as to what wouldn't be bad, if you bumped up rend damage, <laughs> right? And damage debuffs, I think it'd be fine. I think that's spaces you can explore with probably little blowback. I mean, I don't like, I don't know, like that hits me as MPE. Like high supreme damage stuff is not things I enjoy. Uh, I mean. I like playing with my toys. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm and saying you also push units, up damage. And five debuffs. units removed at the top of one. That, you know, that like that's. That's fair. You'd have like to be that, careful because if combined with big movement, then you get the turn one right. alpha strike game goes into overdrive. Yeah, sure. And right. then you push that up through the roof. It's it shows one of the challenges of this, right? In that you need to give right. people special abilities, but when you pull on A and B because of C, you might also blow one of those out. So, right. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, in line with what you're saying, Tom, there was quite a lot of verbatims of not a huge number, but a decent number of people talking about um, having a negative play experience from like Oryx having right. having Oryx come into them at the top of one. And just you know, blowing them off the table, and they're like, and they it was a real feel bad for them. Uh, my uh, my son discovered that when he played Stormcast and pushed everything <laughs> in the middle of the table, and I sure. went, "Are you done?" <laughs> and, then, you and then I introduced him to his other army he plays and what they actually do in melee. Yeah, uh, Sea Monkey. No, I didn't include summoning as an NPE. It would have been a good one to include, like summoning and model refill is something I should have put in there. Yeah, but there's just not there's not enough of it right now to really like crank to eleven. I mean. I, I don't know. That's my personal. Would we be just double dipping on Slanesh on the activation wars? You know, I don't know. It would, it, it'd be interesting. Yeah. NPE army ranking. So the next question in the survey was rank all of the armies in order of NPE, right? So you had every army in the list. Which armies contain the most NPE, the less NPE? Okay. Yep. Uh, cordial did i did i try to control somehow for respondents with an axe to grind i tried to i in the question phrasing i was very specific and repetitive <coughs> in every question as to exactly what i was testing for so i mean that's all i can do i can phrase the question as clearly as possible to say did this exact situation happen is this exact situation please you know what what of this exact situation do you consider npe right so, and I, it, you're not, you can't really grind an axe against a specific army, but you can against a mechanic that can be evocative of an army. It's hard to control for that stuff, really. Like people, whatever's in people's minds, I can't, you hope it comes out in the wash, right? Through statistical significance. That's the best I can say. Okay. Anyways, back to this. Uh, NPE army ranking. Holy crap. Love this one, Tom. You remember the chart earlier where we showed the number of armies played? <laughs> right? Yeah. Now see the inverse of that chart. Right. Right? It's fa so fascinating. It's it's like, hmm, the armies that rank the highest on NPE. And by the way, this is sorted, again, same way as the last chart, where you can read column one is how it's sorted, right? So people who voted it as yeah. number one. And yeah. the percentages run horizontal. Okay. And it's the freaking almost perfect inverse of the last chart, as you'll see in a minute, because I did a little it's nice so visualization. Yep, I saw your, your picture. Um, like, people don't like being hated. 
Yeah. And by the by, Tom, can we just gander at that Seraphon dominance? I know. I know. They almost double the army under them on right. raw NPE count of people who said they're right. the worst army. Yep. Yep. Something yep. like a quarter of all respondents to this question ranked Seraphon the worst army. <laughs> What's one in four? What's the worst army? Seraphon. Yeah. That's insane. Like, that is such a jump over its nearest competitor, right? Because Zinch and KO, more or less neck and neck, right? Statistically yep. insignificantly different. Yep. They both dropped. They both shoot people off the table. Congratulations. Right. Here's your son. Yep. But Seraphon. Seraphon, take all the shooting of Zinch, or all of KO, and combine it with all the magic of Zinch. Mm -hmm. yep. And they get bodies to boot. Yeah, so this yeah. one's great. The only the only <laughs> outlier fire slayers are like, hey, I'm late to this party. What's going on over here? <laughs> Just over here, not dying. Do you, can you spot the outlier at the top of the chart, Tom? Uh, From OBR? our previous table, or no? Cities. Huh. Cities is quite highly ranked. If you remember, it was highly played. It's one of the most popular yeah. armies. Yeah. And yet, here it's still quite highly ranked, right? Yeah, people quite don't like it. And I was thinking about why this is. I've got a theory. I'd love to run it by you, okay? Yep. Because Cities is the ultimate NPE dabbler. Okay? Yeah. They, they've got a little bit of multiple fighting in, like, Hammer Hall. They've got a decent amount of shooting, but not, like, overwhelming Karadran Overlords, although they can bring in some KO stuff, right, into Tempest Eye. They can run a decent amount of high armor for, like, round one or in some builds with, like, Tempest Eye. They can yep. do some amount of alpha striking with some of their units maybe in, like, Living City or something, right? Like, it can be so many different things. It just kind of dips its toe into right. enough little NPE pies that that all simmers up. Yep. Yep. That's my theory. Again, who the heck knows? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's. I think that it didn't show up in a lot of the other like things because of the just simply the diversity, the diversity of units, the diversity of builds, the diversity that it's just not. Um, it's not standout, but those that are standout, like the Hollow Heart, shoot you off the table. Yeah, Hollow Heart it's, spell it's, dom well, for for the for, for, yeah. for magic for spell domination. People, when people think of cities, that's what they're thinking of. Yeah, it was interesting. Once again, by the way, Skaven, dead in the middle, the break point of the table. Like, literally 13 and then 7, they're the break point, yeah. right? And then again, your popular yeah. armies. The only army to get zero votes for top NPE. <laughs> Nighthawn. Yeah, baby. People you want to be everybody's friend? Roll up with Nighthawn. That's right. And everybody's like, cool, cool, we can be friends now. Very popular army. Everybody loves them. Aesthetically pleasing. Nobody thinks they're the worst army. This is the winner. They were the, truly the only army to get zero votes for the so, vote for number one. I didn't have this data when I chose it. But do you think it was an accident that I went from playing Doc uh -huh. at the height of their power to Night Haunt? No, no, I think it like subconsciously you knew you had to atone. I did. I did. I'm not going to lie. I was like, you know what? I'm doing Night Hunt. Mm -hmm. that, this is going to be the Night Hunt year. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I think Oryx end up being low. You know, somebody said it's surprised that interesting or Oryx are so low despite that turn one Alpha Strike potential. I think ultimately People that's... mind a punch up. Right, like... because ultimately there's still an army that wants to go have a punch up. Yeah, right. exactly. Right. They're not oh, shooting you from a distance. So they're not mortal wound bombing the center of your army. You know, they're not shutting you down in entire phases of the game. They're just beating you to death with their fists. Right? <laughs> yeah. I love the, yeah, as somebody points out in the chat, I love the one person who hates on Gits. <laughs> it's just there's somebody who had a, well, the thing is, somebody's like, you guys. know what I hate more than anything? 60 packs of grots. <laughs> that is yeah. annoying. And they were like these guys in particular. What's the worst? One hundred and eighty or one hundred and eighty grots. 
Yeah. Hard yeah. pass. Hard that pass. are returning. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the, the, in both this ranking and the armies played, Skaven's the tipping point, which is it's always interesting to me. So, yeah, uh, I love the inverse correlation here. And in fact, yep. Tom, let's Here's take a look of the, of the visualization of that inverse correlation. So I actually put these two charts together. Yep. And then line mapped them, right? Yep. And look the, at that correspondence. It's it's great. <laughs> it tells the story so cleanly. Okay. Yep. The light blue arrows are when, you know, the army, like, the farther down you go, this is the count of number one NPE on the right, and the armies played largest to smallest on the left. So, just in case you're not getting what we're saying about a direct inverse correlation, that despite what you see at tournaments, people hate NPE-laden meta-busting armies. I don't know how else I can prove it beyond this. Right. 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 Fire Slayers, high on the MPE, low on being played. Right. Stormcast Eternals, high on being played, low on MPE. Right. You can see how the top of the chart is all blue lines that match the bottom, right? And or the bottom of the chart of armies played is orange lines that have to reach up into getting a higher count of MPE. Yes. The interesting exceptions were, like I said, just as we saw in earlier, like Visa Chaos, Suns, which I probably account to, like, not a lot of Suns armies out in existence. I think, yep. if you, you know, and, and also it being kind of a boring army, frankly. Uh, kudos, by the way, to the shout outs to the Flesh Eater Courts, the Beasts of Chaos, and the Sons of Bahamut, who just accept your lot in life. <laughs> sure. Sure. Uh, uh, clearly, they haven't experienced Smash Bat. Absolutely, yes. Can Smash Bat smash that? Yes, he can. Um, yeah, so it was just a really, like, I wanted to do this visualization, and perhaps that orange line on, or that blue, that orange line on Flesh Eater Court should be at the deep blue, I suppose. Yeah. Um, that's that's probably a bit of a uh, mistake there. Um, but at any rate, like, this so clearly visualized everything for me. When I, when I made this line chart up, I was like, oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> right? Womp, womp, womp. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, again, just to repeat this thing I've said 10 times because I really want it to sink in, the best thing GW can do to help their overall sales... Bottom is, line. Their financial bottom line. Is... Arm seem to sell better when they're balanced. Yep. People will, like, one, make great models. That's probably still very important, right? Because, again, we saw... We see Night Haunt dominating over and over again in these yeah. things because people, yes. the models blew people away, right? Yeah. Yep. That's one. Two is pitch for the middle with the rules. Yep. Right? Yeah. The, like, ultimately, uh, Ogres was a success. Yeah, sure. Yep. You know, sure. like, Ogres, Ogres had a lot of, like, hate, right? Um, when it dropped. But the reality is, is that it was... You know, it was liked well enough. Yep, they're doing like, better than their than the the like Bone Reapers that came out at the same time. Right, right. Uh, Assistant Ref asks, "Did you do anything on how many uh, how many example Seraphon chose themselves as the worst NPE offenders? Would be interesting to see how self aware people are." <laughs> I did not. That would have been a great chart. I didn't even think of that, but that's a that's a great idea, Assistant Ref. I'm sorry, I didn't think of that one. One of the biggest challenges with this when I put these together is, and the reason this one took so long is because it was like a really complicated data set. But like, I have to sort of sit down and think about what are the interesting things to find and just start digging in the data and making pivot tables and, and you know, making and digging in cross tabs and not all of them bear fruit, right? So right. It, it's- Some of them are like, okay, yeah, boring. Right, exactly. Like, oh, that didn't tell me anything interesting. <laughs> so. so by the way, folks, we're not done yet. No. <laughs> Tuck okay. in. There's there's a third section to this. <laughs> there is yet another section. That's right. Okay, so negative play experience verbatims. Uh, this is where we're going to get into some commentary. I picked a small selection of comments. There were like 800 comments on this, and I did read them all. And uh, he did like 10. But I did like 10, <laughs> because, come on now. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right, so... 
and and I thought it would be interesting to because obviously I don't know who the heck these people are, you know. Anyway, right. so I thought it'd be interesting to list the armies they played. So yeah. uh, here we go, Tom. Right up your alley. The KO list with the turn one spell in a bottle, warp lightning vortex wombo combo. This is an example of bad game interactions that should have been spotted before release. It's not that you can't beat it; it's that it's a bad experience to play against. Twenty-five yep. plus eels and IDK lists are a marginal here. It's not that the mechanics are abusive per se, like the KO vortex, but it's not a fun army to fight against. Yes, I play IDK. It doesn't mean I don't agree that the list is boring to play and to play against. And again, I net Deepkin only player. It's the only army that this respondent plays. Yeah. So there's self awareness here, right? Yep. What this one, what I drew from this one is there are these, and I picked these verbatim because I thought they were representative of sort of larger samples of what people said, right? And or, concerns. or Yeah, and concerns. And this one to me, what stands out is that there are sometimes just these singular toxic elements. That need errata. Like immediately. Because they're so poisonous that they can just completely ruin people's day. One effect, right? And this is the Warp Lightning Vortex Wombo Combo, as he calls it. This is Total Eclipse, right? Yep. Like, yep. there's been a list of these. Um, this would have yep. been Vanguard Wing at its height. Yep, right? Vanguard Wing Change House at its height. Yep. Sure. That are just like so toxic, so bad, so dumb that if they one they shouldn't get to release, and two if they do, they need to be fixed like immediately, because every day they're out there still being played, they're just poisoning people's perception of the game. I want to point out that we called out the KO warp lightning in a bottle the week that the book dropped. Yeah, sure, because it was so obvious, right? Yep. I mean, I think you had that. I think you were the one that mentioned it to me first. I had I had gotten my hands on a copy of it, and it was literally in. So me and Gary were bouncing it back and forth, like within like within minutes of having the book in hand. I remember us coming up and going, "This is it!" Like yeah. we had seen almost nothing else in the book, and we went, "This is the most broken thing." Yeah, because I think that I is. mentioned like throwing a purple sun in it or the dark fire demon rift, and you're yeah. like, no, and I was no, like, why? Yeah, <laughs> why? Why? Let's make them not move and kill half their army because on the numbers, you know, like I don't, I don't need to rail on this, but on the numbers, if you do the math, no other endless spell will do as much. No other hundred points will ever do as much damage as that warp lightning vortex in no. one in in one double tick. It's not even close. Yeah, exactly. All right, so verbatim number two. Uh, against Beast Claw Raiders, part of the Ogre Maw Tribes, the multi-wound, damage-resistant, mortal wound dealing on the charge and high damage output during combat just makes for an unstoppable force in my experience. I'm sure it's not the same for all, but nothing I've thrown up against a list with multiple large beasts has managed to make a significant dent. So what's interesting here is this this person plays a lot of armies. Stormcast, Sylvaneth, Disciples, Slanesh, Nurgle, Slaves, Nighthaunt, and Warclans. A lot of armies there, which I respect. Right. And yeah. it's funny because out of that list, I'm like, well, with disciples or you should be able to burn that down or, you know, with Nurgle, you should be able to withstand yeah. that yeah. or whatever. But again, the reason I wanted to talk about this one, Tom, and I'm, I'm interested for your thoughts here for sure, is one, one of the things that I noticed is that every army got called out. Basically, there are very few exceptions. If you look in the verbatims, there are people who hate basically every, every army. Yeah. Right? Uh, with the exception being Nighthawk, right, of course. Uh, I literally do not remember a single verbatim that mentioned Nighthawk. Of course not. <laughs> of course not. I'm not saying I mean, there's there's not one. Those Nighthawk, those Nighthawk players are awesome. Yeah, I'm just saying I do not remember one. There might be one in the whole list. I'm sure there's not. But, like armies that we don't con traditionally consider being NPE can oftentimes give some players trouble. Right? Right. Like when you have two blocks of 12 bulls um, that for some armies that's not like that you can't win against that. Right. Yeah, yeah. 
And so it's the 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 relevant part to me here is just how list dependent some of this might be, yeah. right? Because this player, if you just looked at the armies and I said, you know, okay, player A is playing Maw Tribes and player B can pick from Disciples, Slanesh, Nurgle, S two D or or War Clans, right? They can pick they can play any of those armies. What's the win rate look like? And you'd be like, well, it's got to be the second one, right? <laughs> I mean, just on well, numbers, that, it feels like that. Stormcast Eternal. Like, looking at, like, I don't know how they don't just bounce off the Stormcast army with n- all of that no rend ogres. Sure. Well, again, he's talking about the, he's not talking about the ogre build. He's talking about the monster truck build. So. Okay, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yep. Yeah. Which has a lot more rend, right? It's and is a big problem for Stormcast. Yep. So and the mortals on the charge. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yep. And the mortals on the charge. So it was just like it's telling because we speak of these things as monoliths. Yeah. And they're really not, right? Mm-hmm. Um because there are different lists, different levels of experience, different skill ceilings and floors on the armies themselves. Right. Yep. And it makes it a real challenge. Um, Rumi, new player here. Beast Claw feels really ridiculous to play against. What does Slanesh do against them? Sure, I can help you out. So Beast Claw is actually one of your, depending on the exact list, if it's like a heavy Beast Claw list. Um, yep. It's a pretty great matchup for Slanesh because they need to come into melee. You can match them speed for speed. The trick is you need to be like pushing your greater demons and pushing them to go last. You can beat them down. You need to make sure you're not like you need to have your chaff lines out through your like I'm talking current slash. This is all going to change in probably two weeks, but you need to have your chaff lines out to catch them and control them because they'll blow those up. But who cares? Which your chaff lines, by the way, are your uh, uh, your dumb little seeker dudes, hell striders. Thank you. That word did not come to my mind. And you need to make sure you're multi-tapping them for for that. Like, you go in, especially on the Frostlord on Stonehorn hard, you either double-charge it with Keepers of Secrets, or you make sure that the Keeper is there along with the Contorted Epitome. So you've got multiple rolls to make the thing go last. And uh, you make sure that you, like, you need to be the one charging, not them. When they're charging, they need to be charging only Chaff. When you're charging, you need to be hitting them in, in the Tukas. You need to be hitting their big boys in the Tukas. Once you get rid of the Frost Lord, and theoretically like the the uh, the Huskard on Stonehorn, the rest mm-hmm. is all just like waiting to die, um, because the regular Beast Riders pose you very little threat, all in all. So, and by and by that point, you should have built up enough depravity that you're just like summoning in anything you want. So, you could, you could just summon regular Exalted Chariots and go wreck Beast uh, the the Beast dudes. Okay, oh, there you go. Hope that helps, man. The key is you've got to play a very careful game with Slanesh, because you're always on a razor's edge. All right, as a gloom spike gets Maws of Jork, which I love. I think they switched that intentional, which I think is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Maws of Jork. I want to call it that from now on. The Maws of Jork. Uh, I ran several matches versus Karadran Overlords. Whew. Already. Whew. Yeah, exactly. Rough, rough go. <laughs> right? Where we've tried multiple scenario deployment setups, their ability to impact anything on the table from the start, regardless of what I do or how I screen, means they can rid me of my central synergy pieces without losing much on the backswing. Another NPS experience is playing against a city's army with huge Phoenix Guard, Flamespire Phoenix on a 2 plus 4 up. Charge your army, alpha bunker you, or alpha block you in, right? And then that's it. Tom, as somebody who likes both of the broken armies on the broken sides of these combinations, Yep. Of this particular player. Yep. You know, by the way, this is a Cities of Sigmar Fire Slayers IDK LRL dot and obviously a Gloom Spite player. Right. This just sounds terrible to me, right? Like this is this is the worst. You th- I think about that that Maws of Jork matchup against Gradron Overlords, yep. and I'm just like, oh God. What a terrible matchup for them. <laughs> right? That is hard rock against soft scissors. Yeah. And there's just not a lot of options. Like, I'm glad as a, like, you know, yes, you're a Gloom Spite player. I'm glad you have other armies. Sure. sure. Um, because 
I mean, just Gloom's fight in general are just in a bad spot. And so, like, I uh, I feel for you, is what I'm going to say. Yeah, and I there's mean... not... And there's not a and there's not a good solution there. Yeah, to me, what this one showed is how sometimes, no matter what, there's always the chance for NPE because of just really bad matchups, right? Like, strengths and weaknesses. Strengths yeah. and weaknesses. Like the KO are so perfectly set to exploit exactly what the Maws of Jork are doing, and even if we brought the the Squigs up some, you yep. know and toned KO yep. down some, it would still be a bad matchup, right? Just because of the very right. fundamentals of what's going on. Right, right. I mean, the, the yeah, yeah. You're going to have a bunch of mobility variable squigs chasing after dwarves that can pick up and redeploy every turn. Yeah. Yep. Sounds huh. rough. Like, that's, that's a rough go, folks. And they're going to hit and just bounce off those boats that can re-roll their saves. Mm -hmm. And yes, Coach, I know it's actually the Jaws of Mork. We're calling it Maws of Jork because that's what the player said. And it's their army, so it's Maws of Jork now. Jaws of Mork is dead. Long live Maws of Jork. <laughs> I want to see all tournament reports report this army as Maws of Jork from now on. Checks out. Checks out. All right. I, I am all about the Maws of Jork life. That's right. Uh, okay, I played against... Uh, coming soon. <laughs> exactly. I played against a friend's STD Archeon plus Marauder list, and he crushed me into oblivion. Oh. Archeon is already insane, but together with those broken Marauders, I just couldn't do... Yeah, it's... I haven't played again since then because it discouraged me really bad. I put this oh. in because this is one of those ones that broke my heart. And not only that... And this is it, Gloom only Gloom Spike gets player. Yeah. 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 See... I see stuff like this and it hurts my soul. Like, yep. I want this person to play the game. I want yep. this person to have fun playing the game. This is Garbo. Yeah. This should, this be should not anymore. happen. Yeah. Okay. And that, that, like, that's why this one's in here. <laughs> like, I put this yep. one in here because, like, because these challenges are just like so obvious like we wrote up marauders and and we just did we really think that was okay like the s2d book is really so fantastic it's one of the better books they've written yep it is a bright shiny extremely well polished diamond that has this huge inclusion running through the center of it occlusion yep. occlusion i don't remember it has yes. a big chip in it <laughs> right yeah, F's in chat. That's right. Because if you, again, as he said, Archeon's a big problem, but that's not what pushed him over the edge, right? It's the broken Marauders, which right. makes sense. He was prepared to face tank Archeon. Right, because right? he can throw like 60 gets in and he will he'll he can hold yeah. up Archeon with some negatives yeah. to hit. And like, that's a game because Archeon's just yeah. one model. He'd have the body advantage. But when he's got right. these multiple packs of 40 Marauders coming in, blowing his units off the board... Yeah. Making 11 inch charges like it's a joke. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, it, it, it's this is it's ridiculous. So if you happen to be watching this person who answered this question is this and I don't know who you are. Right. Obviously, I hope you come back, man, <laughs> and, and just get your friends to play other armies. Or I hope you find a new army to play with. Or I hope they fix gets or you find something to, to relight your passion because this really sucks and I don't like yeah. it. So. And and in a perfect world, um, we wouldn't have armies that do this. That this kind of stuff would get caught in in design and development, and weed it out. Right. Because that's a per like that's that's what we want. We don't want people to have to suffer through this. Yep. Exactly. Uh, okay. So, uh, you know, when I complain about but you, know waters but you know what? At the same time. Uh, thanks for participating in the quiz. Yeah, I, agree. I mean you're not you're you're not playing, assuming you're hearing this. But thank you for still being part of the community. I agree, absolutely. Thank you for staying in the community, and uh, the the yeah. I mean, if you hear me bang on about stuff like croak and marauders and whatever, right? And sometimes people will push back in the comments 
and be like, no, 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 you talk about it too much or whatever. This is why I bang on about it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Anyways, moving on. Uh, for me, anytime my opponent's army prevents me from normally participating in the game, it results in a negative play experience. I don't mind when an army is powerful, but when it prevents my army from doing its thing, I no longer feel like I'm participating in the game. Armies that can debuff you or abilities like Belakor's Dark Master ability, which can shut down an entire unit or model for a round, are prime examples. I'm torn because these are legit tactics, but at the same time, they're not enjoyable to play against. Slaves to Darkness player. <laughs> yeah. It should be just labeled self-awareness player. Self-awareness player, yes. Yeah, I, I, I included this one because I really felt like I understood this person, you know, like, because this is something I feel very strongly. This is like what this person is espousing is what I often feel. Yeah. As a Timmy, I want to do my army's thing, right? Yep. Yep. And when I face an enemy army that just says, no, you don't get to do your thing at all, yep. whatever your army was about, I'm just like, oh. Okay. All right. Like you're doing your thing, but I don't get to do my thing. All right. What I want is both of us to do our thing. And then if I lose, I'm like, oh, that's fine. Whatever. I got to do my thing. You know, that's yeah. cool. Yep. So I just, I, I felt a, 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 a kindred spirit in this, in this one. Right. Mm -hmm. Tom, what's your thing? Is it just winning? <laughs> Spike. Um, No, no, for me, like for me, like I, if I'm going to be honest, like it's not winning because Vanguard wing is uninteresting, right? Like when that was at the height, I didn't just roll out with the storm cast that I had on my shelf. Yeah. Um, change host. It weren't my thing. And so for me, like I have to have something that's that like, there has to be often some degree of ingenuity or like, I, I can't take the flavor of the month list that everybody's taking. Mm -hmm. So if I play KO in this meta, my KO list, I can assure you, will not look like anybody else's. Yep. Yep. So I want to win, and I want to do well, but I just, I can't, um, I, I think that there is more blue ocean for us to play. Sure. Yep, totally fair. All right, Lumineth in general is a really bad experience. I don't disagree with that. The weaker build, a.k.a. the weaker build... <laughs> AKA hammers destroy melee armies and cost no points for their battle line. The other side is just pure jank for all their spells. Hard to list because it's almost all of them. <laughs> Passing Battleshock off to your units, not allowing you to use command abilities, and never forget the archers. There are other armies for certain things like Fire Slayers and the Fight Burst ability, 60 Blight Kings, New Marathi, Croak, Spell in a Bottle, and a few other things. I think those armies with some point changes could be fixed, but Lumineth is over the top. This is what this is the point I was making. This, by the way, look at the, what this person plays: beasts, ogres, yeah. blades. Oof, oof. Right, all three yeah. of those armies are like, I have a thing, I do a thing, I don't have a lot of tricks. I'm a straightforward army. That's how I play. And they're, they, you know, like on the other side of the coin is literally this army that's got like fifty thousand things they're doing every round. You know, you saw Ben Sava's spell list with Lumineth. Yeah, I did. Like twelve oh. spells, and he's got specific orders, and he's got he's assigned you know each the way yep. that they're all taken on each thing, and it's this, this, then you move here, then you do this, then this spell, 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 and it's like, yep. And also, then I'll burn some gold, then I'll burn it again over here, and you know, yep. <laughs> How does it, it's it's this case of the one I loved about this one when I looked at the, the what this person played. It's why I included this one. Because I was like, boy, if there was ever an example of the haves versus the have-nots. Right? Yep. It's like that army has such a high skill ceiling. It's insane. Like against a great general, that army is extremely hard to beat. And yep. I do not want to know what it looks like plus 12 units. As I said yep. earlier. It's uninteresting to me. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> As we know. Good. Yeah. I'm so glad that you don't like the aesthetics of that army because you getting your hands around Lumineth with its capabilities would just ruin people's entire existences and love of this game. It would just be a bad time for everyone, Tom. You shouldn't I mean, I have that weapon. It. That's Wait, what? You should not have that weapon. That's fair. 
I you need that. to be playing Nighthawk. That's the correct army for you. <laughs> well, I have some on the case, and more need to get painted. There so. you go. Uh, I loved this one, because I think that uh, our friend Shu from Rerolling Ones would agree with this answer. Mm -hmm. Consistency is key. Why are some auras holy within 12 and others within 18? Why can some units fight twice immediately while others have to wait for the next <laughs> activation? Why do most armies have to play to their strengths while well, some are above average in every single phase? SCE, uh, Blades of Corn, and Slaves to Darkness player. Yep. I, I, I'm tempted to read these in the term of like, in the, in the, did you ever watch the Civil War documentary, like the 12 part Civil War documentary? Sure. I, yep. love, I love that documentary. But anyways, I'm tempted to read it like that. Consistency is key. Why are some auras wholly within 12? Like it's a letter back home, you know, from the front. Anyways. Yep. Uh, at any rate, uh, the this is one of those things that I know drives people absolutely crazy. Just these little minutiae. And, and by the way, the way to read this isn't the person saying, why isn't everything distributed equally? Okay. They're not yep. talking about power differentials. They're talking about literally rules differentials where things work in different ways for seemingly no reason. Yep. Yep. Right? So, like, you can fight twice, but this army's fight twice is triggers immediately. They don't have to wait for the normal activation. Right? Right? Yep. Whereas this army's fight twice is, you know, you go, or I go, like, with a unit, right? And then you go normally. And then I get to, then, like, I have something I can spend. Like, Slanesh is a good example of this, right? I have a command point I can spend to make a unit activate again, right? But I can't do it immediately. I can't just, like, fight, fight. Like, right. flesh eaters can. Right. right. It's just the worst. Or, Or to even drive this home... Let's look at the difference between the Keeper of Secrets command ability. Like, say you've got a Slanesh Keeper of Secrets. Obviously, she's Slanesh, but a Keeper of Secrets and a Slanesh Chaos Lord in the same army. Yeah. Okay? The Chaos Lord activates his ability at the start of the hero phase, but it triggers later. Right? He still yes. You still have to go in order. Yes. yes. Right? So you have to, like, guess that, that whatever you're picking to fight twice is going to survive. Right. Whereas the... Uh, whereas the um, the keeper can just wait, see if she survives, and then if she does, then burn her command point to do it. Right. Yeah. Yep. It's just like these little like, differences. You know, it's just so funny because I, I, as you know, I've been playing a lot of Magic. Sure. And like, it just makes me laugh that like so much of this game could just be keyworded. So, yeah, um, I, I want to talk about keywords for a minute because the temptation here is to run to keywords. Okay. Right, but I'm just saying, like, so many of these abilities could have templates. Yes, that's the difference. So if if I were going to do like, this... Like, I use, I use yeah. keywords flippantly, but the reality is, is that templates are what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm honing in on, which are, like, standardized ability sets. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So if you know how an ability for the you know for for ring of said, if you know how the ability works in one instance, it works in all the instances. Yeah. So to me, there's there's sort of this is very much a double edged sword. I hate universal special rules. I know okay? you with a passion. Yeah. Because universal special rules lead to bad design pretty fast. I don't want to. I could do a whole show on this, but I'll try to defend well, it quickly. It, it will often railroad design decisions. Correct. And. Hiding them under keywords is even worse because then I don't want to look at my scroll and see ability A, ability B, ability C, and I have no idea what those things mean. I have to go read a different part of a book to understand right. what those things do. So, right. like, when Magic prints their commons, and I think uncommons, they, they list out all the rules, right? They don't just say, like, first right. strike. They don't they say, say first like, strike. They say first strike, parentheses, it does damage before. Yeah, yeah, it does this it. thing. Right. So I hate universal special rules and keywording in general because one, it leads to railroad game design. Because once you create this repository of just like this is a thing, you start stapling them in wherever you can. Now that's already yeah. going to happen. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm okay with that. But at the same time, you shouldn't hide, like the second you just put like strikes first, this, that, flaming, duh, 
dot, dot, dot. Okay, this guy has eight freaking keywords and no rules yeah. printed on this card. And I've so we're back reference. to playing 8th yeah. edition Warhammer. Right. If I've got 90 universal special rules, I don't have universal special rules. Okay. Right. I mean, the way you cut that, you split that baby, is that you write the whole rule on the War Scrolls, but you standardize them. So if yes. somebody says, okay, what's your ability to do? Oh, it's just pi it's the it's a command point pile and activation ability. Oh, it's okay, I know how that works. Done Yes, it's the way they've done smartly. Like, you you do, you keep the text whole. The best example they've done with this is sixes or double taps. Yeah. Right? Yep. It's a common rule. It doesn't need keyworded. We don't need a universal special rule. It just gets spelled out. It can be given different flavor every time it happens, right? But the text is always the same. And the part of the other problem is that can paper over when you use that universal special rule thing. It can paper over underlying issues which are like broken phase activations. Like I mentioned the Chaos Lord thing, right? I'm activating it. I need to remember I have to activate it at the start of the hero phase. And then I right. have to forget about it for some amount of time, right? And then re-remember, yeah. And then remember that I did that thing earlier and hope that guy survived who I used it on and then go fight with them a second time. Right. Yep. So I really hate like it can paper over sometimes these the real problems, which are often inconsistencies in order of activation, where you have to remember I need to activate thing here. And then now, 20 minutes from now, I'm going to need to remember I did that thing because it's going to have another effect. Right. So at any rate. Yeah. OK. Uh, don't mind armies having their random janky trick, but some armies have them in spades. E.g. summoning by itself is fine, but having summoning plus spell dawn plus buff to still dawns is insufferable. Made me bringing back my 40 chain rasps by times two feel balanced. F.E.C. L.O.N. player. This speaks right to the thing we talked about earlier, right? Where it's not... Right. One of these things is usually tolerable. When they start grouping together... Yeah. You know, and this is a great example, right? You've got the summoning, you've got a spell dom in the house... You've got buffed Bastillodons, so super buffing, plus long range shooting, right? Yeah. Pile on, on pile on, on pile on, where the summation, it's where it's greater than the sum of its parts, right? Yep. That's when we dive deep into the NPE waters. Uh, anything else you want to say about that one? No, I think that that's dead on. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, stacking these things is bad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Stop stacking them. Like, stop putting them together. When you do one, understand that it can't get a second one of these things, or it's going to go bad. And definitely make sure it never gets a third. Right? Right, right. Uh, and then this next one's kind of this along the same line. Sometimes combination of things I don't consider NP can become NP if they're combined in a bad way or put on a unit that's too powerful. Hearthguard Berserker is a good example. I don't think ward saves fighting first or fighting twice are necessarily NP, but when combined on a powerful unit, it compounds and reduces interactivity. Exactly. So not only is it the combination, but it's what the frame you put that combination onto, right? Yeah. Again, take, I, I've said this a hundred times, but it's worth saying again. Imagine if everything in Gristle Gore only applied to the ghoul courtier, right? Right. The four wound ghoul hero, where you can like fight on death and fight twice on death and all of that nonsense, right? Would anybody care? Probably not. No. No. I mean, you might get like a mini smash bat, but sure. Sure. Like, in it, on his best day, he's going to run up and be like, ha ha, I did eight damage. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. And, everybody, and you know, th that'll feel good. Yeah, exactly. But when it's on a dude who can roll up and do like 60 damage, like, whoa, who shot across the board 20 inches or something before he charged, right? Oh. Nope. So it's not just the stacking, it's stacking on a power piece. And the problem is, the power pieces are often the ones that seem to have the most justification to stack on. Because they're the big special guys. They need all the right. big special rules. Right. Right? So you've got to, like, you've got to understand that natural bias we have and push against that. So yeah. let me get this straight. We're here four years later after I submitted that uh, development that that letter of critique to uh, GW 
saying stacking is bad. The summary of this big, like, three page letter uh, re in responding to the Tomb Kings problem was, and how they dealt with Tomb Kings, was stacking is bad. And what we're finding is still bad. Yeah. Don't do it. Bad design. Like, then this, this is not stacking bonuses. This is stacking abilities. Sure. It's the same. But the principle is uh, the same. But the principle is the same. Yeah. Yes. I agree. Spread and, it out. Yep. And the last one here is it's great that armies have strengths and weaknesses. Not all armies should have the same mechanics. The problem arises when one army's special thing is like hitting someone with a wet napkin while you're trying to fight the opponent's army, whose thing is wielding a metal bat which is on fire and plays heavy death metal riffs from doom. Every time they hit you with it. I just love the way this person phrased this. <laughs> so good. <laughs> when so I read good. through it, that genuinely made me laugh. I can picture like the flaming metal doom bat. And yeah, this, this speaks right to the, the inequity, right? And again, yeah. stormcast eternals player, only army they play. Right. Yep. So there we go, Tom. That's it. That's all. <sighs> We, yep. we did it. We made it through. Oof. Um. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Like. So where are we at? Uh. So <laughs> summary. So here's our wrap up. Um. Kudos to you, uh, three hundred and twenty some folks who who survived this long. Um. You know, I. The game's not in a bad spot. Again, we focused very much on the negative here, but it's like I don't want people to overemphasize this. Whenever we do a show and explore the negative elements of the game, it's easy to then get wrapped up in the ennui. And that's not what we're saying. It's not like the game is right. terrible. If the game was terrible, this... I literally wouldn't have spent freaking 30 hours putting together that data. Right. Like this, this, um, what we were trying to highlight with these data sets right or this data set in these these points is that um there are some instances in the game that need to be dealt with there are some uh corner case things that are just very bad experiences that we need to design away from right um and that's okay uh we can correct those easily sometimes you can fix things with points. Sometimes war scrolls just need to change. Sometimes abilities just need to change. Yep. Yep. By the way, just as a quick note on the end, this is why I think community-driven comp or community points is like the wrongest of roads. One, it, as I mentioned on Rob's show, it takes all the pressure off of GW to actually improve the game, which isn't how we should fix things. And two, most things in this game that still have problems aren't fixed by points. Right. Like, in right. the survey, when we did the balance survey, two to one people said the change that they think needs to be made are War Scroll changes. And I don't think right. Community Comp is going to start rewriting War Scrolls. Nope. Nope. So right. it's it's lipstick on a pig, right? Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, the summary to me is they need to think a lot about how they're, when they, when they write these abilities, they need to think a lot about, one, how it reduces interactivity. Two, how like within the army the stacking and how it's going to pile on right and three we probably need to come to jesus about uh shooting in general and what its role is in the game right okay oh they just got their second book well plus 30 points to all units there you go problem solved fixed it no yeah. i mean it's it's bigger than just ko obviously right right yeah no absolutely absolutely um I actually think KO are in a pretty good spot. And of course I say that because I'm a KO player. Um, you're, at the, you're, at, you're on that end. Like shooting 6%? I don't see a problem. I don't see a problem. Uh, no, I get it. I do. Um, I think that they... Uh, I think that they have some really interesting options. And I would like them to explore that stuff more. With the... with like, I think the, the late great hope for KO is in their Thunders. I really do believe that. Yeah, it's a shame when they redesigned the book, they didn't push a little more into the melee space, right? Into having like yeah. the the thunders act more like stormtroopers or something, and and you know, kind well, of. no, you know, you know, you know what the easy solution was for thunders. Um, when they activate in combat, they can shoot instead. 
Sure, like make them a more melee focused unit in some way or another, right? Where it's close up, they want to be in the biz. And the reason why I say that, like, they, when they activate in combat, they can shoot instead. The advantage in that, like, they can't shoot if they charge, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Because you can't shoot if you charge. That's part of the rules. Um, you don't give them run it, like, charge and like, shoot, run and charge or whatever. Um, but also, it would also be interesting because you can only, the way the rules are, you can only shoot at the things you're engaged with. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to use it to like shoot out of combat and kill something else. Sure. Like it becomes truly like an only like what they're locked in with. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, uh, anyways, like we're not talking about uh, Thunders here. <laughs> yes. But, uh, I, I get it. So all in all, there you go. That's the results of the survey. Like I said, I'll try to put uh, put all of the survey data we've done over the three surveys up into some place. Maybe I can put, like Dropbox or something might be the best way to do it. I don't know. I'll think of something and uh, and get all that out there for all of you who've watched. Thank you so much for staying here. I never said the whole, of course, the whole time again. I forgot to say hit like, but hit like now if you haven't already. I really appreciate it. We really appreciate it. It helps a lot of people find the video. Uh, it helps build momentum and traction and all those YouTube terms. So I really appreciate it. And uh, subscribe if you haven't already. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope this was fun and interesting. Uh, the PowerPoint three hours. This was a long one. Uh, just to end on a, a happy note, somebody said it would be cool to balance this with a positive play experiences show. I think that's a great idea because there's a lot of really good positive play experiences that we could highlight as well of what makes the game really fun. I think that would be a great uh, a great show to do so i will certainly add that to our plans but as always thank you so much for watching we really appreciate it and as always we'll see you next wednesday